I'm uh, here with uh, Frank McNamara, and we're doing an oral history. This is Friday, January 10th, 1997, and this is uh, side one. Look forward to hearing about myself. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I understand what, what you'd like me to do initially is to give background to myself. Uh, according to the letter, I mean, that's what I heard. That's fine. If you're comfortable doing that, oh, that'd be I, great. Yeah, yeah that'd be swell. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. fairly easy in that respect. Uh, I'm Frank McNamara, uh, Francis X. McNamara, Jr., whichever you wish to use. Uh, I was born in Haverhill, Mass. I was in school in Haverhill, a parochial setting. Went to Holy Cross College, where I received my BS degree and also my Naval Commission in February of 45. I then served in the South Pacific, came back, and had three years of the GI Bill. And initially, I had no knowledge of the social work move movement. And I was going to enter Harvard Business, although I couldn't get in the September 46 class. So having three years of the GI Bill, I decided everybody I knew was going to law school, so I'd take a year of law, it would never hurt me, I never wanted to be a lawyer. So I was going to Boston University Law and commuting from Haverhill to Boston on the b and train. And a fellow by the name of Bill Kerrigan, who was a classmate of mine at Holy Cross, was going to the Graduate School of Social Work at Boston College. Bill started talking to me about this whole new program uh, of community organization, which only Boston College and Ohio State were offering at the time. And BC was only taking four students in sort of a seminar type of program. Well, about April of the year I was going to law school, I finally went over to the Graduate School of Social Work and interviewed with a the person who had the responsibility for admissions, and found out more about the school, got interested in it, then found out that of the four spots, three had already been taken, and I applied right then and there. I also applied once again to have a business. Interestingly enough, I went down to visit a favorite uncle in Washington, D.C., who happened to be at the time the head of the CYO program for the Washington Archdiocese. When my mother called and said, what are you going to be doing? She said, you have just received a telegram from B.C. admitting you to there. You have a letter accepting you to have it business and a letter from B.U. Law School asking do you wish to live in. I said, well, this has surprised me. I never anticipated. But I had made a sort of thing in my mind that if I got the first seat, the good Lord must want me to be thinking of that field. Talking then with my uncle about the future of the social work movement, then I made the decision to go to the graduate school of social work rather than have a business. Uh, following my obtaining of my master's degree in social work, in which I had interesting things happen, in my second year when I had a field placement at Lynn, Massachusetts Community Test, the executive director, who was a graduate of Ohio State, on the day the board was meeting to set the goal he was only 32 years old. He caught a virus and that evening choked to death. And so I was left by the school to be there during that campaign without there being an executive. And I watched a group of volunteers run that campaign and I did learn a lot of how not to do something. <laughs> In actuality. <laughs> After the campaign was over, 
I was uh, sent down to Quincy, Mass., for the planning and allocations phase of the community organization program. Uh, when it came time to graduate, and we were putting out our papers and resumes, the four of us had great discussions of whether we should go into a large community chest or go out on your own initially. Uh, interestingly enough, two thought they should go into a large United Way, a community chest at the time. It wasn't a United Way in those days. And two went into individual situations. And I was one of the ones, and I, the job in my own hometown opened up. And I applied, and I was 24 at this point, and I got the job as executive of the Haverhill Mass Community Chess and Council. One of the things I learned is if I had a, another life, I would never do, is go back to my hometown. Because everybody I had known as Mr. Ewing, Mr. McGregor, so forth, I all of a sudden had to change over and become George, Lawrence, etc. And they were that much older than I, and I had always been told to respect my elders, etc. Yeah. Now then, the first campaign was really a learning experience. My campaign chairman uh, was, and I, was a community chest and council, so we had both the planning allocations and but there are separate bodies. In the campaign, the followers campaign chairman had a leather business, and he had determined he was going to liquidate his business because he was losing money. So all of a sudden, this 24-year-old novice didn't realize that he still had a lot of assets. But all he talked about was how troubled he was, and I learned you can never have a campaign chairman that's going to cut his gift <laughs> as a kickoff to the campaign. Probably one of two hottest campaigns I've ever had in my life. However, we raised about $89,000, but it was a $96,000 goal. And following that, we got a good campaign chairman, <laughs> a person who was truly committed, a fellow who never had a college education, who was a Ford dealer, hmm. but who really believed in people having needs and programs. And the question of uh, campaign structure, I started to learn a little bit about that butter rather than as uh, and more horizontal than vertical because the volunteers get more involved if they're at the top. <laughs> uh, it was just a little learning experience at that point. I also learned that the campaign chairman had to give more than he had done the year before to set the tone. I really, uh, it was a learning experience, but one of the most interesting experiences I learned about was employee campaigning. In the first campaign, Haverhill being a city with a great number of shoe factories, and shoe factories were definitely depressed, but also was very seasonal. And my father had been, and my grandfather had been in shoe business all their lives. Now, they weren't housed in Haverhill, at this time, anyway. And the first year I ran a campaign, I found nobody was working in the shoe factories. So I said to my father, when do they work? <laughs> and he told me the season stuff I shoe employee campaign, the first part of July with the uh, wood heel people, and then up to the, as the shoes progress up through to the cutting and to so forth, you went through the various stages. I also found, therefore, there was no loyalty because for people would work for whatever the length of the run was. Sure. Well, I also determined that, therefore, you couldn't develop a committee inside the company that would have much spirit about the company. So, and 
I knew that you, if you could get a group of people together to tell the story, two before you ask them for any money, the people were much more generous because of the fact that they had heard in the group what it was all about and their minds were open because they were just a part of a group. So I suggested we, what we needed to do was to get the owners to allow us to come in to present our stories and shut down the power. Well, because in the shoe industry, people were on peace work. And the union complained. You couldn't do that you know, have a rebellion. Well, I found that I convinced similar. Now, what we'd do is bring agency volunteers in. We'd organize every morning a group of agency volunteers. They would come in as the solicitors. And we would, on these two shoe factories that were picked, we shut the power down on one and the volunteers that now would go around. And the other place the volunteers just went in and went around. Mm -hmm. So when we shut down the power, we had no reaction. And we had proceeds that equaled nine times what we got when we didn't shut down the power. And the union fellow was just a happenstance. Mm -hmm. So we took two more factories. It proved out that it was 20 to 1. So we also started learning a little thing about the group dynamics that happen within industry as people go back after hearing the story. If you're, for example, in a stitching room where you got a line of women who are stitching, if the first person took out a dollar and handed it to you, the whole row won a dollar. If the person signed a pledge, so as we learned a little group dynamics, we learned to say, even if the person wanted to give a dollar, do you mind having it done through the payroll so I won't have to handle it? You know, this is an agency volunteer, we don't want to handle them. Mm -hmm. So we put the dollar back in their pocketbook and sign a card. <laughs> so then the other people would start doing it similarly. So you learn that, and you want to, really what you found out also was the since I, we didn't have films in those days, it's too small a community and so forth. I spoke on every one of these floors and could watch the faces of the people and their interests. And you also took note that as you talked about services, it was best to try to identify yourself with some services. That would then put themselves thinking about services they were using. For example, I would use the fact that I, as a kid, had used a boys club, paid a nickel for the membership, etc. Everybody might think that that was enough to run the club, but it wasn't. What we were doing is we used the fact that the dad had need of a visiting nurse. He could afford to pay, but the nurse had to be available for those who couldn't afford to pay. And you went through a few agencies like this, well, this got, and then you might since it was a society of prevention of cruelty to children in the state of Massachusetts, you learned to bring in one or two cases of that. But you had about five minutes, and you try, to, and then you try to say, you had asked the bookkeeper coming in how long the run was, and if it was ten weeks, you talk about a dollar, this is now 1950, you know, a dollar a week for ten weeks, a dollar a week for five weeks, two dollars for five weeks, and try to relate that what we had 17 agencies so what that represented to each agency. And so it was a making it human, making it a group orientation, and then a easy solicitation thereafter because they've already been solicited in the talk. So this was a great learning experience. Now, in the second year of the campaign, we had set a goal of 111,000. Now we got to 106, and we were close to closing when the top volunteers said, we can't allow this to be a failure. And so we had five night meetings in a row at people's homes to review. And then our campaign chairman and the bank president even went to a local bar 
and sat in there all day where the shoe manufacturers came in and resolicited people, came back, and we uh, they'd get together and say what they attained that day. And in five days, we went by the 111,000, and we just saw it. it was a spirit that got that really grew in the community. The community was fantastic. Unfortunately, at that time, in the middle of that campaign, I came back from the Holy Cross Syracuse football game to find a big brown envelope recalling me into the Navy for the Korean War. I got a deferment as it was December the 1st to finish the campaign. These volunteers were so hepped up, they all came together and they froze themselves into the positions they had until I would return. So for two years, the volunteers with my bookkeeper ran the organization. And this is one of the things about a hometown. I came back, the campaign had been a, they had raised less than, they raised the year that I had left. And there was a particular individual who was really a strong campaigner, a Jewish philanthropist, who felt he had accomplished everything that could be accomplished and the community could not go into place. And I happened to sit in the allocation meeting before coming back on full time. And it happened to be that there was a person on that committee who was uh, executive VP of a savings bank whose name would not identify that he was related to me, <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> and this person who had led the campaign and was board chairman said, we have to send a word to the agencies. The greatest amount of money that can ever be raised here has been raised. Any expansion is going to have to come from within you, each of you, etc. So, this fellow said to me, sitting on of me sitting on the side. Do you think that's true, Frank? <laughs> and I said, well, I am positive that the greatest amount of money that could have been raised this year has been raised. All right, I think if we can get more involvement of a lot more people. And the president will say, you're a young man. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> So, anyways, <laughs> we had a very interesting problem at that time. This may have to be eliminated. So I'll say it. But what I found out was that this particular individual and my bookkeeper were having an affair. And this is a, made it very, very difficult, to say the least, to come back into it. But at the time, she was a capable person, a very capable person, and yeah, she was married, and her husband, and so forth. And, but we had a campaign chairman who had a successful local business, who happened to be at the time the chairman of the American Red Cross chapter there. And in a small community, the pay levels and so forth and the amounts of who you're recruiting to be executives. Ultimately happened was that my bookkeeper became the executive of the Red Cross chapter. And my board chairman became the chapter president of the American Red Cross. Thought it was the greatest agency that ever existed at that point. However, <laughs> That's a surprise ending, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there we were. Uh, we <laughs> set a goal of, they had raised 106, I think, the year before I got back, and set a goal of 123, and raised about 126 sling a year. There are a lot of interesting stories, a lot of work done with agencies, uh, which I could talk about, but, you know, not that many people are going to know about here in Massachusetts. So, mm -hmm. Ice Community, which was a perfect size community to go in and learn, uh, I mean, you have all the aspects of what needs to be done in every community, 
the next the various larger communities just needs to be broken down into segments or structured in such a manner as to have the same flow of information and understanding and commitments by volunteer leadership. <laughs> now, in 1955, I had an interesting set of opportunities. I actually had almost decided to go to Sioux City, Iowa when I was called by United Way of America, which everybody should realize is nothing but a trade association, in effect. Mm -hmm. Most people are run by United Way of America, not, mm -hmm. not the local communities. And I think this should really be highlighted because, yeah. it, especially of late, mm -hmm. everybody started talking about local chapters and all that. There's no local chapter. If you want to be a part of United Way of America, you can be. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, the question of, but the person and personnel, one of the big values to the communities was the fact that they kept resumes on people, and, and the fellow who was heading up the United Way of America's personnel office called and said, wanted me to hold up making my decision because the people in Newport News, Virginia, wanted to interview me. Well, I knew my papers had been there since April. This is now June. Well, let's say yes, this is about. I said, why? He said, I think you're too young. That's why they haven't had you down there. So, uh, it came to the fact that I went down. And here was a community that had never raised its goal in history, had had raised 198,000 versus Sioux City, which is raising 500,000. Or, well, uh, I really got bothered. I really got bothered by the fact that the administrative assistant of the chairman of the committee called me to ask me to come down, not the chairman. But she did a tremendous sales job on the community and how it was really coming alive and business and so forth. And so if I, I said, okay, I'll come down. Then nobody ever met me at the airport. I got down and I to the local hotel there and walked around the corner to the office to find that the office of the Newport News Warwick Community Chest was on the second floor of like a whole, what do you call it, tenement? <laughs> it was, and you walked up this narrow stairway and I walked to the, to the front office where the two women were working, American workers, and they had hanging lights, no <laughs> fluorescent lights. They had two dark rooms back to the executive's office. And the executive's office had a window out made of a piece of cardboard. <laughs> oh <my gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Everything you wouldn't think about. Yeah, interestingly, what had happened was the board chairman who was a great volunteer but did not have much uh, been an old time name in the community and what he had done was he had created some committees not just the board members and the personnel committee he had gotten a guy to be chairman who was really the second most powerful person in the community and uh, this I realized that at the time but uh, a very strong committee, and one of whom was the publisher of the newspaper. And so the interview was to take place at the newspaper boardroom. I have to tell you, there were about 18 people there. It's probably the best interview I ever had in the social work movement. You know, the whole blessed thing about it in the way of a community chest. But they gave a great interview of what they could think it might be. So, and there was another person out in the hall when I came out to be interviewed after me. I had taken note of the campaign chairman, uh, not the campaign chairman, the chairman of the committee, having stated, well, he'd never really been involved in the community, just 
There's never one. Had never been involved in the community uh -huh. justice. Uh, he said, here, here's the keys to my car. And he told me where I could find it. Why don't you ride around the community and come back to my office at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock? So I worked. It was a hot, hot day. And it was a dry community. So I went out to the officers' club at Langley Air Force Base and had a cool drink. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back from the Air Force Base, the rim of his car fell off. <laughs> I don't know what the hell caused it to, but anyways. Uh, interestingly enough, I always had a deal, which I would never state what I wanted for a salary. I never have indicated a salary in my life. The pay is, this is what I'm making. Now, would you offer me what you think you should offer, and I'll make the decision on whether I'll come. It'll be based on the professional side of it, not on the fun side. Now, Sioux City, and because you've got to go back to the years of different types of money, Sioux City had offered me 8500 which the job, and I uh, go back to his office. They offered me the job. They offered me eighty-five hundred, which was that simple. Mm -hmm. And I always got it. Uh, how the hell could they have ever determined this? But anyways, mm -hmm. well, I didn't give an answer then, and I called him a couple of days later and said there are two questions has to do with the factor that you haven't been involved in the community. I say yes to you, will you be involved personally? And he said, school child was six to one black. Now Warwick was the residential community, but it was a separate city. And you know, I'm coming in, I'm going to be known as a Yankee. I wish to do is I wish to be able to sit with you and maybe one or two others to discuss these difficult positions and say where I should be, think you should be. Mm -hmm. And then I want to be able to know that I'm going to have support. I do this all of the time. I hate Sioux City too when we're in the news. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, we got down there. I went down on August the 15th at 55. And a fellow by the name of Herbert V. Kelly. By the way, the name of the chairman of the committee was uh, Lloyd Nolan. And at the time, Nolan Plumbing and Hardware was the largest independent hardware and plumbing supply business in the southeast. And, because uh, I didn't know that, I didn't know about the plumbing. Yeah. It was over. And Kelly was a young attorney. He had over been 35. Very, very bright, interesting story of a person. He was a fellow who was the son of the police chief of Williamsburg, who later, after I left, became the chairman of the Board of Regents of William and Mary. A bill that is still today about as close a friend as I have. Uh, so, uh, the uh, down there in August, not, they had voted the goal when I got there, a 25% increase. <laughs> I had indicated in my interview, because I had done it in Haverhill, that I believed in having agencies. And I had been successful in Haverhill the four years that I did it. Now, but I assumed that they would wait until I got there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, the goal was 252000 and it raised $198,000. Outside of a campaign chairman on August the 15th, I didn't have a single other person recruited. He had no kind of structure. And with my campaign chairman, my first night there, a little bit of a structure. Uh, he gave five times more than he had given the year before, which was still not right for what he was earning as I found out later, but I mean, it was still five times more than what he'd been giving. <laughs> and uh, so uh, 
He said, I assume you have some sort of commitment from Lloyd Nolan. Who was the chairman of I said, yes, I have a commitment. I said, he should be really the chairman of our advanced gifts division. But Lloyd had also invited us down and talked to a nice dinner party for my wife and I after we accepted at his home, which was a little bit of, had to broaden the campaign structure more than it ever had been, but not as broad as it should have been and ultimately won. Lloyd was away was not too bad until I had to live with it. It was just personality at the story of what ultimately we get to. A date from, with Lloyd for about the first day after he got back, five o'clock at night. He was a worker. I mean, just when I went down to see him, and so we went back and forth and so forth. And Lloyd kind of says, look, I'll give you a call tomorrow. I'll meet you in the rest. Hers is not. He says, Lloyd, how, many, how long would you keep an employee downstairs in the business if he allowed somebody to say, I'll just give you a call back and I'm selling a bathtub? <laughs> well, he said, well, not very long. He said, well, tonight I'm selling bathtubs. <laughs> I remember these discussions as vividly as if they were yesterday. That's pretty good. So, this one. Lloyd's wife called a couple of times. Finally, he said, look, I'll give you a meeting tomorrow then. Okay. So we went back. We had a meeting for 2 o'clock. We said, we can't go in here since two of us are alone. So we brought a third vo another volunteer with us and bought a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there as he came back to lunch. <laughs> He accepted. <laughs> and he says, yeah, he's all tied up in his father's estate. He says, I don't have any time until October the 4th at 4 p.m. This is now the 1st of September. The campaign's to be there fall. We don't even have an advanced gifts list of a mind run a campaign. So we went back on October the 4th, and we decided we had to get an evaluation committee. Who should be on the Avescus? But before we could do that, nobody was a giver because they hadn't done any campaign, really. All these people had to be oriented and solicited first before they could be on the evaluation committee so they could evaluate properly. Well, Lloyd and Rufus wrote up a role and responsibility of an evaluation committee person. I always recall the first person he called was the president of the Bank of Virginia. He said, Eddie, this one. Do we in for 10 minutes? Yeah. He says, come by and it's going to cost you time and it's going to cost you money. <laughs> <laughs> he was after us. <laughs> so we got a group of about 14, but we needed to have the right chairman. Well, I find out later that the key, a key individual in Southern politics is the judge, the legal system. Bree Smith was a perfect person who had all, everybody believed in her. So, so, and the job entailed meeting for five days in a row to review lists. And these are all the top people from that. <laughs> it was really. And we, and he had solicited every one of these people when he went. We also realized that we had to get, by the numbers of people we needed to make it successful, we had to get 25 captains. He didn't want anybody in between himself and the 25 captains. So he would go out and recruit 25 captains. And he would basically do the same thing. At the same time as a recruiter, he solicited him. But he had the evaluation. He told how this evaluation committee did. And he then had a meeting of the 25 captains at his home for them to pick their prospects. And they decided they needed to have something to get these people together to feel 
the change at the then community chest. So he will have a dinner. He owned the uh, Chamberlain Hotel in Old Point Comfort. He owned five hotels. And uh, for dinner, and invite all of them there. And he said, General Motors had a great speaker at the time. I don't know if I can have his name starts with it's a Matt Donovan, kinds of leaf. And I'll say, uh, and so we had about, I guess, 300 people come to this dinner that he paid for. It was a dawn to dusk campaign. He had a breakfast for all the workers. And in that one day, we raised about $140,000 within 50000 of what the hell they'd ever raised in history. It was really a, well, that's kind of the budgets he got coming into that thing. But. So the campaign was very, very successful, it was being very successful. And this herb, I herb, they never had a victory dinner, they never had anything to celebrate. I said, herb, the community has never had a success. We're going to have a great success. But I can't say that we should have any kind of an affair unless everybody's there. And so they are getting workers from the black community, from the goods, dinner at a hotel, which at that time still didn't recognize. But he said, I think you're right. He said, but I don't know what we should do about it. Well, I said, I don't hesitate to have my first board meeting discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> so he brought back the selection committee, with one exception, who was the one black had been on the selection committee. That was a great idea. Once again, I have to go see what Judge Herbie Smith has to say. He said, it's an idea, probably. We probably should allow it. Good for the community. We have about 15 or 20 of us that might have problems, but we might be out of town that night. If you can get the hotel, to allow it. Well, hell, the hotel was the one that the chairman of Advanced Gifts, uh, my chairman of the selection committee that brought me there, owned. <laughs> so we got them to turn their back on the fact that we had dinner of over 400 people, of which about 80 were black. <laughs> First integrated dinner ever held in New York News. <laughs> and from that time forward, there was no problem. <laughs> and I was I can recall getting to the hotel because, of course, uh, people were working as volunteers in particular divisions and uh, residential areas and so forth. And so I thought perhaps that these people would be sitting at tables that might be, you know, but tell them I'm not going to go tell them. <laughs> and so uh, no, no problem came out of that. And we had a campaign that went from 198 to 286. We went $34,000 over the gold. Interestingly enough, the following year, Hampton Community Chess, which had raised $70,000, come in with us. And we had card value. No, the request come in? No. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Let me just see where we're at. Uh, hold on. Go right ahead. We set a goal the following year with just the Hampton chest coming in, which was now we had card value probably of about <coughs> 310000 Set a goal based upon the budgets of the agencies and all that, 425000 And we hit 511 mm. The following year, we brought in the Red Cross and made it a United Fund, and even created a health foundation that the health agencies wouldn't join because they had national policies against them. 
and we created a health foundation with an allocation of 98,000 and set a goal of 700,000. A year is an interesting aspect of all of these, because by now we have great rapport with this, the gal who covered us, the nonprofit beat. And interesting going, the city of New P well, meanwhile, I should tell you, when we're bringing the Hampton community just in, and the, the vote going to be taken that November of Hampton, Warwick, and Newport News merging into one city, politically. And because the business people really wanted it, because you know, whether I want this quote on a tape and I will strike it out of things. It's a very sensitive situation. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the business community, which the power of business was all located in the city of Nipadus, which was only four and a half square miles, which had this preschool balance of six to one black. Mm -hmm. And they wanted the base being broader for the total community, mm -hmm. and because it was really one residential area. But Hampton was a very, they tried to stay separate from Newport and everything going. So when this was coming up for a potential merger, the calls I got from business, don't you allow this thing to come to a vote on Hampton just merging with Newport News unless you're sure they're going to vote for it. The Warwick is already a part of the Newport News community. So, therefore, well, we got the vote, we got the merger, which was really a, quite a, interesting. Also, by the way, a, on an aside, it's the first community in which I found, you know, they talk about the buying of votes. Well, you used to see precincts vote within the black community, 847 to 2 and 950 to 5. I mean, there's no doubt what was happening. It had to be. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to have such one-sided uh, votes. But apart from it, it was a great learning experience for me. Uh, and we had a great planning council, which we had as a separate entity. And we did a lot of merging of agencies during this particular period of time. And interestingly, I found a very interesting thing from a social work community standpoint. They had both a white and a black YWCA. The black YWCA was probably the most successful YWCA movement I ever saw in my life. Before or since. We had within the school system a great program. Never imagined any group work agency being more successful than this was. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anyways, the, uh, we had the, we, from 796 goal that we, our amount we raised, we now, uh, here at day 14. When the budgets came in the following year, the budgets were less than what we had raised. So, I can remember saying to the executive committee, I said, look, if we got to set the goal by what the budget committees are recommended. I said, on a campaign of 800 and some odd thousand dollars, you can put some money in for a reserve. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, it's disaster to set a goal less than what you raised. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think I remember saying to the executive, look, you people hired me as a professional. Just believe me, I'm standing on my head in the middle of this table <laughs> telling you, <laughs> do don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. But they did it. Um, they said, we've been honest with this community. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about a tough campaign. It's the only time we had to extend that campaign 
and Alzheimer's and different things. And interestingly enough, the city of Newport News, the, the, by the way, the election, Hampton voted against the merger. Newport News and Warwick merged into one city. <laughs> out of that. Well, but we had, we represent a whole area. Now came the uh, question, the city of Newport News, the city of Hampton, and the city of Warwick had each been giving, it's the only place that ever happened that I know of, thousand dollars to the community. The reason they were, no, one of the reasons that they did it was they were turning down people like the visiting artists and paying fees for service. <laughs> they had a real bargain. Now, interestingly, the publisher of the newspaper has now become the mayor of the city, emerged city of New New York. Our covering us happened to be at the desk next to the political report. She is, she is, before she comes down and says, I'd like to do a story on all the other communities in Virginia, whether they give gifts to the United Way or not. So she got all Then Hampton Institute had great involvement with them by now. Uh, we had great relations. In fact, the person head of development for Hampton Institute uh, was active with us. And so Let me stop. This is. We uh, went out to his office with the reporter, our reporter, the non profit reporter. And we set up a whole series of questions. To, and we called each of the same cities we knew that they were calling. And the reporter, how much was going into visiting the Earth Service, how much was going in here, how much was there in there. The day that the newspaper article hit saying Newport News is well over the only communities giving money directly to the community just the afternoon newspaper which was run by the same people had a story saying Newport News Warwick is saving over five hundred thousand dollars by giving the twenty <laughs> so we just knocked him right on the head so it's just the fact that we had a great relationship with the reporter who was willing to tip us off, and we then developed the story that knocked them into the no man's land. <laughs> so we got our 25,000 for each of us, our 50,000 now with the Merge City. So it's a, uh, just another interesting aspect of, it was a, uh, it's a great site, I learned I would say that if a person were looking to live in a particular size community, a community of about 200,000 people is perfect from the viewpoint of the social life is pretty much all centralized. The cultural life is big enough to bring culture in and afford it. and it's just a, no, you have to have other things that go with it. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be there when a community started to emerge as a result. And uh, it was a, uh, you know, I have to say, Newport News was a fantastic experience. We raised nine, 890000 my last year. The campaign chairman my last year there was the fellow who was the chairman of the selection committee when I with them. And interesting as it's by this time we've done a lot of things new. Uh, he had descriptions for every volunteer. We had developed the whole thing of line solicitation which was uh, you orient them and he's been doing that then for about three or four years. So, uh, interestingly uh, as far as I would only solicit personally the board chairman and the campaign chairman. 
are, I would do one, and then the other person would come with me to do the other. I thought of myself as to who to go to see this fellow, who I knew by now was a very well-off person, you know, but it's still 1959, so I go by myself. I, uh, a lot of interesting aspects to it. He had had his administrative assistant sit in the selection committee. He didn't know at what point one could you. <laughs> I challenged me on something. <laughs> anyway, so we had a guideline of over $300,000. The person would be, a generous gift would be 4%. I never say figures, I just say the concept. You believe in the country. He said, well, I'm not going to give you a figure until you tell me what you think that is. <laughs> so, wait, you're just not going to get a figure. So I finally said, okay, Lloyd, I think you should give $20,000. Person. Half a million dollars in my life. I said, Lloyd, I have no idea. You said you wanted a figure. There was a story in the paper about a tax problem. And it mentioned 500000 I didn't know whether it was one year, two years, or three years. So I wasn't taking a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave 12500 <laughs> uh, You know, it's very, you know, all these things are so intriguing from a personal perspective. You learn that if, I learned quickly and easily down there that you know, people think of a two-on-one solicitation being a pressure solicitation. Oh, it's good pressure. The pressure solicitation, when it's one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. the person who's being solicited and the person soliciting are both defensive. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have an orientation meeting in a group and then you have a two-on-one sit-down discussion, you make it a discussion. You discuss what the hell took place in the orientation meeting in the group. Mm -hmm. And do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Mm -hmm. You never say figures. Mm -hmm. You let them come to their own sure. guiding factor. Sure. Sure. That really makes it a easy yeah. type of situation. Yeah. Uh, so I had the opportunity then. I was offered an opportunity to be president of a company in Duke Days. People who then I had the offer for Rhode Island to go to Rhode Island as the executive. And went to this Herb Kelly, who was a lawyer. He happened to be the lawyer for the company. My wife loves it here. Uh, we sit here. He is in the process of getting a doctorate from Ohio State. He had the chairman called him and asked him to get back. He completed his dissertation and while he was back getting his doctorate, we were discussing firing. So this big release from Ohio State, youngest doctorate. <laughs> A month later, he's fired. <laughs> now he's a young enough man that I try to protect him, which I did. And he got a job in the Council of Social Services as the research director. But then uh, he was a uh, uh, I'll complete that story. I went to his boss and said, "Look, I don't want to hear anything coming out of it." I was in Rhode Island about half the Rhode Council executive and said, "What happened?" And he says, "I fired him." I said, didn't Dr. Cannon call you to find out a reference? He was the top guy. He said, no. I is the number two person at the top because of this resume. About two years later, maybe three, I said, I didn't realize he wasn't at the state health department anymore. Calls and wants a date. He's now representing Medicare for the whole New England area. <laughs> And I said, oh, what a resume does that nobody ever checks. <laughs> Isn't that something? Oh, really did operate in his case, I can tell you. So, anyways, uh, that's an aside, needless to say, but I just, mm -hmm. for my first professional employment. <laughs> uh, well, 
I left in January of 1960 to go to a community of Rhode Island, which was a place into itself. I offered the job the year before, and I told him my, my papers were inactive. In fact, I've never had my papers active ever since I left. When I uh, had gone up, I told him before I went up, I said, there's no way I can take the job this year. You still want to interview you. And so I went up. And I thought, well, they said, well, you have the number two person we'll have is an acting executive. I said, I just want you to know it's I was an acting executive. Having been through the Newport News hiring situation, I determined I would do one thing before I don't take it. I asked Lloyd Nolan about the fact of being involved and about the problems and knowing that they didn't have top leadership involved in Rhode Island to the level that it should be. Lots of philosophies. He will say, allows you to get into the whole allocation process and the planning process and how the, the total picture is. Um, generally speaking, at that time, probably was like a five to one ratio of dollars that were involved in the budgets of the agencies in the United Way versus the dollar you raised. And so he said, did you know you were really directing not the amount of money you're raising, but five times that? <laughs> the all entities, religious. And in Rhode Island, you, Catholic Charities was separate and apart. Not a part of the, you know, a very Catholic fellow who was the executive for me up there. I felt that was. I got to the newspaper publisher, who was one of the people I was interviewing, and they had given me the vice president. I had heard that the newspaper was about to do a series of stories on what's wrong with the United Fund. Did to really by, I think, the United Fund PR, it's the PR staff at the United Fund, because they wanted to take a shot at the ship of Fanat. I didn't finish the question, I asked if we would get them. I say, what do you think are the greatest weaknesses and strengths of the existing United Way? Well, if they're not involved, they're going to say, well, they don't have all the leadership they need. My third question comes back, I can't ask you, but if the community were to ask you, would you accept responsibility as a leader? So that, I said, based upon that answer is whether I'm going to come through Rhode Island or not, because you can't do anything without leadership. Mm -hmm. Do that before you have hat in hand. You can't say it after you have taken the job. Yeah. So, uh, and I got to the publisher, and he said, well, you know, I can't get involved, because he says, you know, we have editorial comment we have to make and all this. I said, the community's a little bit bigger than editorial comment. You can still make editorial comment whether you're involved or not. You can even take action in the organization against what we're doing. I said, that's an old time thesis of newspapers. I'm about to do a series of stories on what's wrong with the NFL. If you're not going to blame it all. <laughs> I thought this would be a PR when we go through this year. <laughs> I said, you can't have. Yeah, you had to have the top leaders involved. And so, uh, sure enough, the stories came out. They did put an extra article in about leadership having to be involved, which had not been involved. But the Catholic bishop was really hit. And he knew was a pompous Irishman. And, uh, Said yes. One person in Rhode Island, other than the selection, oh, who had been a classmate of my father's at Holy Cross, who was a speechwriter for John Pastore. And I called Tom Meehan in Washington. I'm proud of him. He said, My advice to you is if it's a right 
Island for a year. Now I go to Rhode Island. And interesting enough, you know, I missed a long time back here. I mean, this is my feeling about the key elements of the allocation process that I believe was involvement in the allocation process is the key to the whole United League movement. Well, to know and feel it's money for money's sake. The allocation process can therefore only be utilized in a Haverhill Mass. You know, I had the big 20-member committee, but when I got the Newport News, I had about eight or nine budget panels with about 15 people. And knowing that these things are all intertwined, I had letters sent by the board chairman to the head of Catholic Charities, the head of the come to serve on the allocation process. Is that the letter? Oh, this paper, I only had two other things going for me, being a Holy Cross graduate and a Boston College Graduate School. I was invited to alumni meetings, and usually the bishop would show up at those meetings. I just went to the meetings, and I went up and just said, my name's Frank Nightingale. At the same time, we had started adoption proceedings, and I may not put this in there, but in the news, but we had a, the true Catholic charities in the news, and since we then moved, we had to start all over again. Oh, so the director of Catholic charities who had come out of the budget panel I got to at least meet, he became my caseworker. Hmm. I could tell you, a caseworker they discuss business with me. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> but anyway, uh, and, you know, the interesting aspect of it, I'll give a little bit of an ending to this whole story, and then come back to the story. Enough that he was a BC graduate school social work graduate also, but of course he didn't. And I put up the money, and I'm a dean of the school, so I never even had met. <laughs> so... But anyways, uh, the, uh, I told him the story of what I said to the publisher. And, uh, and my party said, now run a campaign. And I heard the head of Grinnell, Jim Fleming, complain. You know, that Grinnell made all the fire extinguishers and sprinkler systems. And, like, you know, BIF Industries, which is a division of New York Airbrake, and New York Airbrake had a policy of not giving to denominational campaigns. Did doing with Tell and Tell. But it was headed by an Irishman. Well, oh, so after about probably I got there in January, the follow and my wife came in June. So it was probably about March of the following year. I had the head of Catholic Charities set the thing up with the bishop for me to go in. And I told him the story of the newspaper. I also told him, I said, it's a horrible thing you're going out there in terms of a bigotry campaign. you got the New York Airbrick, the systems, and they asked. I said, why well, complaining, New York? And I said, the telephone company isn't bigoted because you got an Irishman running it. <laughs> I said, you got to get some sense in this whole thing. And I said, what we need to do is get some leadership together. That's all I So, I had a, the head of, I had interviewed these people, one of the people I had interviewed was the head of Narragansett Electric. And here's my campaign chairman, my second campaign. And here's the other guy, whatever. So, the fellow who was my board chairman took over, and the two of us, you know, because of Narragansett Electric Company, the fellow that moved. So, there came a, uh, you know, it's just one of the things you go through that, you know, I sat with him about two nights before and I told him he still it in him, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so when we to see the vision, we decided we'd try to invite him to the family, some major community affair since they've had this meeting privately. But there are five things we want to ask him, but first and foremost was to get him to come to our kickoff. I don't know whether Mr. Ewing is going to go along with this or not, but I'm going to suggest we'll kick off any night in October you're available. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me a Sunday night. <laughs> See, I, I kick off on a Sunday night in my life. <laughs> yeah.
and we had it at the boys club in South Providence. And so to the bishop, well, Brian Shaw, well, the newspaper didn't leave anything but imagination. They took a picture of the head table around the hall. It could be nothing but a success with the height of Catholicism and the height of Yankee sitting side by side. <laughs> so, I, yeah, what we did was we created a structure, let's get broad, especially as far as the major advanced gifts and corporate gifts and individual gifts were concerned. And we created an evaluation committee, etc. And we went after people who had been campaign chairman of Catholic Charities to be chairman of a division. You know, locked in with Henry Sharp and Bayer Ewing, who was the height of Yankeedom, going to ask these people to be a part of them. All you were doing was bringing leadership to leadership. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Catholic versus the other, it was yeah. leader to leader. Yeah. Yeah. And so we created, we had 19 divisions in the advanced gifts group. And then what we would do is we'd hold Rhode Island's a small enough state that you could have your report meetings of these chairmen in a home and make it personal. And we intertwined people uh, of all groupings. Um, because we didn't have just the advanced gifts people, we had the chairman of employee groups and chairman of all these. That's how we as staff knew what the report was. All we were trying to do is energize the people who really is to be responsible or feel. Sure. Sure. And so we had just great success. Uh, and I'm sure everybody continued to be oriented. In fact, I, out of it, we, I learned to uh, choice test and put questions they could possibly know the answer to to make them feel that they were <laughs> inadequately <laughs> oriented. <laughs> I remember Henry Schaaf getting up. He said, geez, I've been involved for four years here, and I can't get for 66. <laughs> but you had to do make it fun. Yeah. Make, oh, we had dinner parties. We always had dinner parties for the cabinet and the recruit. We had the divisions have dinner meetings at their homes for their people who were working. We made it a personal, real, fun time. And I think one of the most interesting things was that we ultimately got the bishop, came every year, you know, after that. Mm. And Henry Sharp sent him Winnie the Pooh in Latin, saying, I don't know who else could enjoy this. <laughs> and the bishop sent him some great organ music, etc. And Henry Sharp, we set up a clergy division for the Catholic clergy campaign. And we had the deaners, deaneries represented, and we... Uh, Monsignor Cassidy from Pawtucket, I can recall, Henry Schaap stopping by at his rectory and saying, you know, I've never been in the Catholic Church, he says, and I, I'd like to see a confessional. Mm -hmm. And here's Henry Schaap taking mm -hmm. And it was really a epic. And so we had just fantastic success in terms of bringing everybody together. We made it a Statewide, United Way, with the exception of West of the. You know, it was too far south. Newport come in, and the Newport Summer Colony, and so forth. And we just had great success. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the. I learned in that community, and I used to say it to the staff. When I was in graduate school, I heard about how it was the building of a community and interrelating the making. I said, I said it as words, as I physically enveloped people in Newport News, and then I saw the aspects of it as I saw success in campaign, but it was really not the, even though I had the first integrated dinner I ever held, and I had a lot of integration thereafter, it was not the interpersonal life that took place in Rhode Island, I said, I, I really saw it happen. I mean, I, yeah. when I went to Rhode Island, he used to say that the Catholic Protestant and Jew didn't know one another and didn't speak to one another. Yeah. 
And within the Catholic community, the Irish, the French, the Italian didn't know one another or speak to one another. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things I spoke to the bishop about on that day we were getting them to come to the first kickoff. I said, yeah, Excellency, a chance to chat with you about the black and the white problem in the South. Mm -hmm. You got the problem here with the Irish, the French, and the Italian. <laughs> we're not the only one with the problem. <laughs> you have it. And so it's going to help you to be involved and be a part of it. And so uh, he, uh, a year after I left Rhode Island in National Geographic, which is a political magazine, they did it Rhode Island. And Henry Sharp is quoted as saying, when asked, what had all of a sudden brought Rhode Island together? He said, Rhode Island was known as a melting part of the country only for 75 years, we never melted. It was only six years ago we found the vehicle, which was the United Fund, which got the water boiling and the people melting together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, I thought, uh, as I'd say to the staff, what you had to do is keep in mind what you're trying to accomplish in terms of structure and so forth. So now then, while I was still in Rhode Island before I came here, I was invited to come down to Houston and interviewed for the job in Houston. And I was offered a job and I insisted on interviewing 15 to 20 people. Mm -hmm. Ferguson, the executive VP of Exxon, was the board chairman. And he was chairman of the selection committee. Well, I didn't get a real feeling of a tremendous commitment by Harry. And so after the whining and dining, and they wanted an answer and so forth, and I said, well, I'll give you an answer on Tuesday. On Saturday in Rhode Island, if I want to go see Holy Cross play football, I can go see Holy Cross play football. <laughs> she said, you're not making the decision based on that. I, I said, no, but it's a pot of living. And so, anyways, on Tuesday, on Monday I called him. I said, Harry, I have five very basic questions to ask you. It was all about commitment to doing the right thing in terms of getting leadership involved and responsibility. All the right answers. I said, Harry, you surprised me. I will call you tomorrow. I went to Mass the next morning and prayed, and I went in, and I called Harry, and I said, Harry, do you remember my questions? Yes. I said, are the answers still the same? Yes. I said, to come down. It was some of the people, it was some of the people I've met with already. And there were some people who weren't in town when I was down there. I always remember the name I came up with. Like Gardner Simons of Pentecost. He says, Gardner's not going to get involved. <laughs> I said, Harry, did you know that he headed up a capital fund? Oh, but I know Gardner. He isn't a guy that's going to get involved in a thing like this. He said, no sense in that. I said, no, Harry, there isn't. I'm not coming. He said, how can you change? I said, I didn't change. You changed. Mm -hmm. You gave me all the right answers, but you didn't mean it. Said, Won't you take more time to think about it? I said, Harry, I'll be glad to think about it for the rest of the day and call you back tonight. But I said, I doubt that there's going to be any change. You've changed me. I let it all the people I had interviewed and thanked them. I was with the person who took the job the night before he went over for an interview. He said, that letter, <laughs> he said, really, <laughs> kept everybody in the high gear. Yeah. Especially since one of the guys I wrote to was the chairman, was the board president of Exxon, who was because this guy's boss, who I had a commitment that he'd be a board chairman of later. So, but, you know, you don't know why it happened. Who knows why that happened? Yeah. Following year, Los Angeles was known as the compromise community of the country. It had a, it was so compromised that everything a good United Way would be. And meanwhile, the federal government had created a program called the Combined Federal Campaign, which is against every principle that a good United Way would have. I became sort of the leader when I was in Rhode Island, of the volunteer, the uh, 
of our professional staffs of the country fighting the Gambaya federal campaign. And in fact, through John Pastore, we initially got written in that a United Way had the right to veto having a combined federal campaign in the regulations. Now, by federal campaign... It means all the federal employees. All the federal employees would, would have, have a combined, combined campaign with for our health agencies, for everything, and I designations okay. ad infinitum, uh, etc. Okay. Everything is no planning or thoughtful process involved at all. I see. This was an outgrowth. I mean, it's a part of the outgrowth. You go back into the 50s, late 50s. It used to be everybody was in the federal government campaign. They didn't have payroll deduction for anybody. No, I mean, it was just a Eisenhower. I mean, Eric Colson, who was a Dartmouth graduate, wrote the initial points. And I was, of course, in Newport News at the time, and I was one of 41 cities that was quite, uh, you know, sort of Washington to well, how to use envelopes. But the United Way Fund could use gold envelopes. The Red Cross could use white with the Red Cross on it. And the health agency's green. I can always remember asking, why green? Well, I'm a Dartmouth graduate. <laughs> United Fund could have a pledge to be billed or a key man collection, but could not have payroll deduction. The others could only have cash. No, okay. dedu no deductions. No payroll deduction. Mm -hmm. wow. Now came Jack Kennedy. And the Federal Personnel Office. This is actually by the time that it all was done, it was started as an idea under Kennedy, but was really being implemented by Johnson. I get him to set up a meeting with the president to really hit some. Well, I learned a little bit about politics. This is going around the circle a little bit for you, but I don't know whether it's interesting for you or not. But yeah. It's a part yeah. of the whole. Yeah. So, I don't mean, he said, Congressman Fogarty had been from Rhode Island. Fogarty's the guy who created the National Institutes of Health, as you may or may not know, and very powerful Democrat. Congressman. The Geographic Institute was about to be established, and he got it for URI to have it out of the University of Rhode Island. Fogarty dies. to be taken away from the University of Rhode Island. Hello, Frank. You can only take on really one major issue at a time. And my words to President Johnson are, if you want a single vote from me this year, lies the if a senator can't hold on to something that a congressman got, <laughs> it is bad. Mm -hmm. And he says, so I have been on that issue now for the last two months. So I'm not the best person to put a, a big bang on it. He said, I'll get the regulations all right. But as far as the feeding the whole damn thing. So he gave me, he got me Ferris Bryant, who had been the former governor of Florida, and a, who was available at the time of Washington, and so I met with Ferris Bryant. <laughs> well, ultimately, uh, what they did was they picked out six cities that they figured would not fight them. Washington, D.C., which was you know, totally dependent upon employee personnel. Chicago, which was a really loose federation to start with, did not have a truly representative committee, just all you know what we're going to Los Angeles, which we would be asking for because they had all the compromises in the world here already. They didn't represent anything. And San Francisco. Uh, those were the cities that they hit. 
We discussed with the United Way of America, did they wish there were a whole bunch of communities who wanted to fight them? Do you want us to fight the CFC inside the United Way of America or fight it outside the United Way of America? Mm -hmm. Lyman Ford was the executive at the time and he said fight it from outside. He said because then we can fight it from inside in a different way. Mm -hmm. And you they'll know that you really mean business. So I became chairman of a committee on United Fund principles. <laughs> and Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Boston. We held a meeting in Pittsburgh. This will tell you how I happened to get here, probably. It's an interesting story. Oh, no. uh, the executives of Detroit and Pittsburgh were, are very, very, were in those days very, very strong people. I mean, the guy who was Detroit had created the first United Fund in Detroit, and Henry Ford was his great buddy, and, and I mean, he had the big three mm -hmm. totally behind him. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones who got American Red Cross to change their national policy to a local option. I mean, this is. This is another history. I mean, if you don't know the history of this, this is the history of the United Front Movement, which is another part of this other than my movement. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, uh, I'll go back through that, maybe. Just remind me to go back through that whole history. Yeah. He was born here in Los Angeles, by the way. Oh, okay. and that's part of the history of moving up through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, where was I? Uh, well, we're in uh, Pittsburgh again. Consortium. I had written up A, B, and C ways of attacking the problem. And Pittsburgh and Detroit, we had an executive committee the night before, in which the executives were for a specific fourth way of doing things. They were what? For a fourth way, I had A, B, and C, they are for D. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. okay. Mm. They felt that we should, their major thing, thesis was, we should try to tell the Washington we didn't want payroll deduction. It was payroll deduction that was creating the problem. And that they're forcing us into being with others without any allocation process, without any other thing process. Just, uh, they probably had a, you know, a, a reflection now. I could probably say they might have had a, a good idea, but I think it would have been impossible to knock parallel deduction out after it once went into those mm -hmm. six cities. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wasn't for that program, and they were, you know, there were about 14 of us there in that executive room. And I knew where everybody basically stood in my own mind, anyways. These guys kept saying, well, let's take a vote on this. I said, no, we're going to have more discussion. You got it on the table. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to have a, a vote publicly. I'm going to ask each person to give a private vote on a piece of paper and hand it to me and I'll see how we came out because I knew if they voted in front of these guys it all capitulate to them. <laughs> so I, I won on the vote. So now comes the question I have to rewrite a few things that you know sending a couple of guys out, and I said, no, I can't do that. I have a meeting tomorrow morning in which we'll have a rewrite for this. Well, it was a foolish move because these two guys started politicking during the night. And so I came back and said, they were putting up all kinds of fuss on the new deal, and I, I, they called for the motion eight times, and I, <laughs> I didn't take it. <laughs> Finally, I lost. Okay. So I lost the vote. Now I have to go down to this group of about 60 communities representing. I always remember this poor guy from Huntsville, volunteer, got up and he made the motion, which was my motion to start with. And he saw all these people jump up the Pittsburgh and try to talk to him, to knock him down. The poor guy didn't have any idea what hit him. I said, it's not the role of the chair to say this. I think you're right. <laughs> but I lost in an executive committee session before him. So we 
but uh, well, about four or five days later, I have a call from all the Laylar in Detroit, which yeah, I talked to him a couple times in between. Hey, Frank, have you heard anything from Los Angeles? I said no. Nope. I will. They had an executive search firm. You know, my papers have been out here for a couple of years, I guess, or a year and a half. They had a well, Anyways, uh, I'm convinced that Laidlaw and Gavi talked to the executive search firm and recommended basically that I had the guts to fight them, <laughs> I think. So... I came out here, and of course, the single largest impediment to being successful here was an organization called AID United Givers, which had been created by the community just in 1951. And that's the history of the Treated in Group Donors. Okay. Well, I'll give you that little yeah. history of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I came into being, and why it did. Well, and the volunteer leadership of the selection committee liked what I was saying and wanted to, but I said I won't come unless I can interview 25 people. They were scared to death because AID United Givers was really by this time recognized or accepted or believed to be an organization dominated by labor. wasn't dominated by anybody but the staff, but I mean, who had accessibility to labor, mm -hmm. right? that's, mm -hmm. and utilized labor. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't labor. I was afraid if I got into a discussion with Sigarowitz that I might try to take this thing too far, too fast, and all this type of stuff. Right, so look, I recognize the community comes of its own time with us. And I came out and I interviewed him. It was a little bit of a part of it. Lundberg, who was chairman of the board of the B of A, was the board chairman of the United Way at the time. And he was uh, the selection committee, in effect. It was an aid account. I mean, he loves an aid account. He one of the 100 largest firms were an aid, as far as employee campaigns were concerned. 17 were implant federations, which, you know, are United Funds inside the company, which were dominated by a committee of the inside the company that uh, left three were within the entertainment industry which is a separate federation completely and then you had about 21 firms or something like that let's see 61 17 18 3 19 three were united away firms <laughs> uh but so you most of these executives uh, the leaders that i saw were people who headed up companies that were in aid. Uh, I saw both Frank Gillette of Willocks. Uh, you know, it's a uh, check fundraising, more mm -hmm. fundraising. Mm -hmm. and don't you dare change the, try to change the Red Cross agreement because he had negotiated the Red Cross agreement with the United Way in 1964 and got a special agreement because Red Cross at the time had more leadership than the United Way did. Fritz Larkin and so forth was, and I, oh, I saw uh, Lloyd Austin was head of Security Pacific, which was an interesting interview because I went to see Lloyd Austin, I didn't know, other than the fact that Security Pacific was a very second largest bank. And while there, I'm looking at the business, oh, hell, I guess it's Rhode Island. <laughs> I said, this is big. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, uh, when I got in, it turned out that Lloyd Austin's brother, I knew, Fred Austin, was the general manager of Brown and Shaft in Rhode Island. Oh, my God. How small the world. Yeah. And amazing. so uh, yeah. he took out the total clear, all the giving of the banks at that time, it's done through the clearinghouse. He took out the total clearinghouse giving and showed it to me. I, I I had an access all of a sudden which I never would have anticipated, mm -hmm. and uh, well, it's a 
uh, question of make a life and, and uh, everything is basically centralized although the power of the organization is in 14 in a way up to 1963 had or I should say LA County up to 63 had 39 separate key rising totally I guess but the key was that nobody had control of their own destiny because of aid United Givers and Permanent Charities Committee which was the entertainment industry and the Implant Federations they dominated the capacity to do anything but anyways he led what had to have been the most fantastic community organization job I've ever done I don't know, George Hill may have told you to see Cecil Feldman, I don't know if he ever told you that or not. Mm-hmm. There's a whole history, Cecil was the executive when 39, or 33 initially, community chests came together to form what is United Way today. There's 33 community chests, and I tell you, I've merged two and three and a few others. The feeling of part of their own communities is yeah. tremendous. To merge 33 at one time, I tell you, is a gigantic (laughs) job. I give Cecil had to be very able, but I also had to give tremendous, because it really required volunteer involvement to the nth degree, because there had to be somebody who had some access to the volunteer leaders of all these places. And Tycor in those days did, because it represented probably 85% of all the title work done in L.A. County in those days. Mm. And uh, mm. so he was able to relate to the corporate leadership and the volunteer leadership uh, mm. of all these communities. Mm. And so in 63, the United Way was formed, uh, 33 of these community chests. Uh, in 64, the American Red Cross joined for what became the United Crusade campaign. And in 65, Cecil was released by United Way. Now, and it all, it undoubtedly comes to play. Now, I have no idea what ultimately was the problem. I never did bother to ask questions. I just figured anybody who's professionally gone through the merger of 33 communities, just a lot of communities are thinking they're not getting what they should get. Mm-hmm. All these things, everybody who's a volunteer leader out there is going to be attacking the professional head. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it becomes a question you can't therefore solidify anything with the person. So mm-hmm. no matter what they put on. And in talking about the separation of Cecil Feldman comes the question of the United Way of Los Angeles, I believe I probably stated that the name United Way, which is now used across the whole country, was created in 63 by the merger of all these 33 chests. And that name came known as the name, since it meant the United Way of Planning, the United Way of Allocating, and the United Way of Fundraising, as opposed to everything prior to that having been basically on the campaign side, a mm-hmm. joint appeal, a community chest, a community fund, uh, a united appeal, a united fund, a united good neighbors fund. Uh, everything was related to fundraising until the name United Way itself uh, mm-hmm. was born. And it was born right here. So Los Angeles has that much to do. Uh, credited with. Uh, in 65 to 60 through 66, there was a interim executive, uh, Larry Cooper, uh, and there was a selection committee looking at the country for a new executive. Uh, I'll a search firm, which Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of. Uh, 
I know the fellow who headed up the company had been the person who was a key person in the Walt Disney uh, estate and, and all, and was felt the responsibility as chairman of the board of the California Arts uh, College, which got created and, and so forth. Uh, now, he personally did not do the search, but it was his firm. And a uh, fellow by the name of Herb Hawley was the executor, if I can remember his name, as the person who had the uh, responsibility. The committee was headed by a person by the name of Louis B. Lundborg, uh, who was the chairman of the Water Bank of America. And uh, well, they had interviewed many candidates, uh, and this is what I don't recall, although I studied it a lot previously. I had a call from Walter Laidlaw in Detroit, who was the executive in the uh, creation of the United Fund movement in '49, hmm. who was a definite power, even though our United Way was autonomous. He was well recognized nationally in the field, and I had fought him at a meeting oh, in 50, talking about the, the subject matter of that, when he said, has anybody in Los Angeles called you? And I have assumed, whether rightfully or wrongfully, that he was the person who suggested that the Los Angeles interview me. So I came to Rhode Island four times. Now, I was offered the job after the first, but I had insisted as I had come to handle all opportunities on interviewing up to 25 individuals who are not, who are key leaders in the community who are not involved with the United Way. This community was so compromised in terms of its ability to control its own destiny uh, that I knew for a while as a person who chaired the committee on the United Way principles, uh, I had questioned whether I would be the right person and whether we could confront the issues ultimately that were dividing the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second meeting had to do with the factor of making sure I wasn't going to create a problem by going around to interview the 25 people on these issues. <laughs> Uh, I said I thought I was <laughs> wise enough not to do that. However, uh, and as I think I outlined it earlier, that you know I had three basic questions that I asked. <laughs> Ticket for my wife was sh to see Showboat on Saturday afternoon, but we're talking about going to see it ourselves. So. Anyways, I came out and interviewed 25 different individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, having done this and having gotten proper answers, I saw which were quite interesting because yes. <laughs> one of the individuals I interviewed was, who was not a part of the selection committee, was Dan Houghton of Lockheed. And he was to be the following year's campaign chairman. Well, Dan had not been involved in the actual merging of the various community chests into the United Way Act and hit the Red Cross and had just joined the agreement, which was an excellent agreement for Red Cross. He they wanted the campaign to be that was born out of that putting together a Red Cross. In 76, when we finally changed the name from the United States back to the United States, it took place 
when we had withdrawn from being a participant in the paradigm of how to put together the soul of in this piece, uh, you know, some part of the planet history of L.A. I was L.A. so compromised. Uh, you know, 39 different committee chests all by this time the night of funds existing in Los Angeles County. Coming being autonomous and local, they were easily seen as to probably why back going back into the twenties and thirties, the first year you know, the first joint appeal in effect was in nineteen twenty four in Los Angeles, City of Los Angeles, when the really just a booklet someplace up there that was held because we celebrated our 50th anniversary in 1974 and it has a whole lot of the backdrop of this. So let's see if I can find that. Oh, and as the community just all these grew and so forth, and as the geographies got bigger, in each of these local heavily problem of employees who went from one city to another to work. So the you know, community chest, you know, fund movement had a statement saying you give where you work in order to have services where you live. When people there was a various conflict and one of the Problems in Los Angeles, starting in the 30s, was that the big aerospace industries were all around the circumference of the city of Los Angeles. They were not in the city. And this community just United funds would go to these large employers and ask for money. And so ultimately, what you saw happening is the first breakdown, the development of what we call implant federations. Was these companies created a united fund within themselves. And then they created committees to distribute the money. Well, these committees did not have background of all the social needs in the community. It's got divided in various shapes and forms, geographically, uh, in terms of types of service, like health services, health agencies. And so you, the biggest problem, however, was it became a block, and it was a community, and they didn't feel any responsibility for the total community. They were just distributed to large amounts of money. And so therefore you blocked that off and divided them from being a part of the community, except in the recognition from having given a lot of money. Sure, sure, yeah. I'm afraid of both. It sounds like you were in better at bridging golf players. <laughs> first breakdown in terms of being able to unite a community as a, as a whole. <laughs> but it probably was mainly because there was greenery between the cities and towns in those days. And therefore, the thing onto the provincial aspects of being a small United Way interest in their own local community mm -hmm. was very understandable in, in that era. <laughs> Uh, and certainly the formation of these things were not done to create this division, yeah. but was a management means of handling the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now in 1941, the next division came. The entertainment industry, which was basically the movie industry in those days, Basically, we're not a part of the downtown 
power of Los Angeles. And this was because of many reasons which could be somewhat understood. In order to create, I think that they're interested in all the permanent charities committee of the entertainment industries and a campaign and set up a payroll deduction system which, which was all the workers from job to job, which was a unique aspect of it. But have the chairperson of that come down to the most of the money would go to the LA Community Chest Welfare Federation. But the only relationship there was was when the chairperson of the campaign and the board chairman would come to the final meeting and produce a big check. And this would give recognition to that community period. Mm -hmm. But it kept them from ever integrating into the total community. And even today, very little integration exists between the general community and the entertainment mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. uh, later, uh, 1949, which is the start of the formation of what is called the United Fund Movement, which was done in Detroit, just the American Red Cross nationally to change its national policy of one of local option and gave permission to the health agencies as the United Fund movement got started in Detroit and it brought together, it was started by the big three automakers and the UAW, the ones who forced a lot of the national agencies to give local options to joining or not joining. Mm -hmm. And uh, 19, that was 49 and 1950, the leadership of the LA Community Chess Welfare Federation was interested in trying to create a, United, a county wide United Fund. <coughs> interesting quick enough, they tried doing this by having a mass meeting, which not, idea. which was not too successful. Especially with the Lodge of Dimes, which fought it constantly, I mean, any federation at all. That was 19, so that nothing happened out of the 1950 meeting, excepting that the business leadership of the time determined that what they should do is create a system wide campaign for all the major firms headquartered in LA that go out to the suburbs. Basically, your banks, your retail part of the community. In fact, while the LHS or Welfare Federation were supportive of this, it was started, um, the initial leadership was a Harry Vogt and a Justin Dad, and I don't, there would be others, but I don't, those are the two prime founders, in effect, the mm -hmm. first board chairman of the place where the bylaws were developed and so forth. And this, and the LHS put all of its major firms and play campaigns into this organization called Associated In Group Donors United Governors, which was to be an employee campaign basically across the whole area that it covered, mainly the county of LA ultimately spread out into Orange County and Ventura and so forth. Uh, as the stores went and the banks went, they went. And so, and the organization was to be one third, and the board was to be one third uh, labor, one third management, and one third public. Uh, and they just took the responsibility for running this organization at first. And in the first year, it was not as successful as they had wanted it to be and what they wanted to raise. So the LHS in their judgment did something, which was to put some corporate gifts 
and to make it a huge success. And so they put the banks, which gave through the clearinghouse in those days, and the gas company, and the telephone company. The entity of the United Givens was run by the LHS until 1953, 54, in that era. The executive who was running it left to become the head of the United Appeal of Cincinnati, Ohio. A person was employed to run there. He, having a separate board of directors, able to talk that board and saying it's wrong because probably about 85 to 90 percent of the money was coming to the United Way's uh, community chest within the long for you to be headquartered in the same office as your largest beneficiary and broke it away into a separate office. This entity, therefore, was strictly became a fundraising conduit. They never set a campaign goal. They just ran annual campaigns as much as a company wanted to run an annual campaign because we accept whatever. It became a very passive organization. And the board became quite passive, excepting for the fact that it was a place where more of the one third of the labor leaders attended and then the members, levels of leadership from all which it, it present them. No presentation of, of needs. The monies were uh, distributed by a formula that was created that could be massaged, shall we say, in line with the professional staff's desires to a degree. Not great, but to some degree. And uh, organizations that were beneficiaries got the chance to go before a, a allocation committee because 20% of the money was to be distributed in line with how the allocation committee, I should say, is 20% after designations were taken off. Uh, designations not. I mean, that was so complex, as an example, the Formula to our volunteers who went to make the presentation. And Victor Carter was our presenter at this particular time, and as he started to result, based upon your formula, this is the executive of AID said, Mr. Carter, can you hold up while I explain the formula to my committee? <laughs> <laughs> so that you can understand. <laughs> well, anyways. Aid United Givers controlled the destiny of the community because 61 of the 100 largest firms, employment firms in Los Angeles were a part of Aid. By this time, you had 17 of the, of, the, of the remaining 100 had implant federations. Three were a were part of the permanent charities entertainment industry. And which so industry? Permanent charities, which was the oh. entertainment. Okay. Entertainment, okay. And the remaining 19, United Way had the opportunity to solicit directly. So that the control of the United Way movement was strictly by the smaller firms and those larger firms which would not participate, some of which would not participate, mainly because of the tremendous involvement of labor in the other program, they didn't want to be that tied. Some were due to the fact that they were so tied to the United Fund movement from someplace else, like the auto companies, which existed then in, the, in, this, in this community, which don't exist today. But those were the major big companies Edison never joined. 
interesting. You know. But it's a uh, uh, so that's what the United Way had to work with, and with aid not having expanded campaigns through the fifties when this place was booming, I mean it went out, but went up in a percentage nowhere as close to what the community was expanding. That all the thirty-nine community chests were dying for money. And that's what ultimately brought about the urge to bring some countywide mechanism. And they felt that if they could have a countywide United Fund, a United Way, the United Way, the United Way wasn't existing then, then you'd have success. But the question is, <coughs> it gave a leverage, but it didn't give a an ability to go to those companies yet. So the destiny was still controlled by the... Now, that's what I say the place was so compromised. And it was well known across this whole country that this thing called aid was the worst thing that could ever happen to a community. Now, when I came in 67, Way or you know, Crusade was only raising twelve million dollars on its own. They were getting about a million dollars from PCC, and they were getting about seven point three, seven point five million from agent and givers. But it hadn't gone up more than. 500,000 in three years, the total amount. Mm -hmm. So, at that time, when the United Way was formed, there was a merger, as I say, of 33 community trusts initially. And in order to get the volunteers of those community trusts to vote to participate, they had to create a structure that the local community just felt that they still were going to have a lot of say. So that they created 14 areas in the structure of the United Way. These 14 area boards, so they went from 33 chests to 14 areas. And Three people would be elected from each of the area boards to come to the corporate board. And then there'd be 15 members at large on the corporate board. But the control of all policy is in the 14 areas. In order to change a policy, the fees at the corporate level, which were made up primarily of people from the area, would develop a policy statement on any issue on agency relations, on planning, or anything. Add it to the corporate board for their authorization to send it out to 14 area boards. When the 14 area boards would vote on it, make comments, send it back in to the administration. Well, then it would be rewritten, re-voted by the corporate committee, bring to the general board to be sent back out again. And they had 60 days then to vote. And if 10 area boards voted for it, it became policy. It didn't matter whether the general board voted 100% unanimous. Unless 10 area boards voted for it, it was not policy. Well, to say that the control of the organization was in the areas is an understatement. The allocations of the monies that were raised were allocated centrally, excepting for those agencies whose services were completely within the boundaries of a particular area. Well, most of these areas had only two, three, or four agencies. 
It's a budget. Pasadena and Long Beach had more, you know, 17, 18 agencies. So the area board looked at all policies as it related to what it would do to these three or four agencies or these 16 or 17 agencies. Never what it did to the major agencies, which are serving the whole area. <laughs> so the whole allocation process was a very compromised situation. So why I'm coming here. There was very little volunteer involvement at the corporate level of the campaign. The campaign was underway when I got here. I actually got here in July the 17th, I guess it was, and I was to take over August 1st. I have divisions reporting to the campaign channel, plus they had 14 of campaigns going. I was very quick, I was very quick to see that one, The area staff didn't know one another. Never mind, as a corporation, nobody knew one another. Certainly, the you know, the areas of the corporate campaign was basically non-existent. Oh, and I should say that one of the things that happened in the formation of Another aspect of the Red Cross Agreement was that the 14 area boards, they had 14 area co-directors, Red Cross, any other way. There's no one person in charge, staff wise. Um, Supposedly, the person who was the director of the Los Angeles chapter of the American Red Cross was so strong, they certainly had had more volunteer leadership than the LA United Way had at the time of the web, that's why they got what they got. He had been there for a long time, everybody at United Way was scared of him. It was just, I had I came with the knowledge of having the, the various peoples behind me as volunteer leaders, most of whom were CEOs of companies that were about of eight. Uh, and uh, who was to be the next year's campaign chairman, that interview, which I did not finish, this is going to be all jumbled up, uh, had indicated when I went out to interview him. He said, I don't want you fooling with the Red Cross Agreement. I don't want to hear about Red Cross being considered to be out budgeted and reviewed. What this community needs to do is raise more money. He was one of the firms that had an implant federation. Uh, they had what was known as the Buck of the Month Club, which they had then put up the Bucks of the Month Club because of inflation and this. The community had a guideline of giving of, for well, the hourly worker six tenths of one percent uh, to be requested. You know, people give it or don't give it, but the question is But here, lucky because this guy says we have to raise more money and give him maybe a couple of bucks a month, but was close, not close to the six tenths of one percent. And we had an executive guideline which started at one percent. So I just, knowing where I was and knowing his feelings right or across and having done enough study of history before I got there, while I kept bring forth the ideas of the values of planning to him. And took him where he was, which was to raise more money. And I said, you know what, you people aren't carrying your share. I mean, you're asking the committee for this, you're doing this. 
in order for you to be parallel with what's being asked of Earth, you should be asking 1%, essentially going and giving 60% of your money to the United Way, how you going to say You should be asking your employees for 1%, because 60% would be 6 tenths. This is your friend. He was a giver. He himself was a giver. And uh, so they changed their formula. It was very beneficial to him, as it turned out, because in the very first year of that campaign, which we got the benefits of the second year, their increased giving brought about $400,000 of money from their employee campaign. <laughs> so the question was, but I really knew that I was potentially in a difficult spot with this man, because philosophically, we were not akin to one another. <laughs> and I had not accepted the job at that point, so I called Louis Lundberg was out of town, so I called Ernie Lobicki, who was the father and creator of the merger. And I said, look, at he and I just don't see eye to eye at all philosophically. I don't want to come here and just be in an argument the whole year. And he's the one person in this community that's so funny. He did a sales show back at me. So, so all the way it shows that I did come. So Dan, Dan was an interesting personality. Because that was my first, it was the first campaign chairman of the year I got here, but he was halfway through the campaign. And while they had a guideline called fair share, Victor was a giver, and he used to get up. And he, he never understood fair share. <laughs> He'd go up in a meeting and say, "You should give 20, fair share plus 25 percent more." <laughs> and he was trying to, so uh, he was. Uh, he was interesting. Uh, a, a great, great man. Great philanthropist. Mm. Great positive force for community. Mm. And uh, so, uh, one of the first things I had to do there was the close to Victor. He was a leading clerical area. You know, I'm going to take lots of dinner party for the total staff. How many loan executives do you have? So he took over his band, uh, the United Crusade symbol of ice and so forth. A thing that the people who are still working for us always will remember was the greatest thing that ever happened to that staff in their lives. And uh, we had a fantastic roast beef dinner. And, mm and dance bands and all. So, uh, and the following night, what he did was, he had a penthouse on wheelchair. He invited all the volunteer leadership of the areas to come to his penthouse for an event. To just preach this whole community perspective in an informal way. Um, and so, when I, during that campaign, um, those were tough campaigns when we had a really dependent, getting all your money from the area, basically, the, the uh, person of mine to be board chairman after that, but I, he was not a chief executive. So, you know, I've never had a person from the Jewish community as board chairman. Now you got a guy who's doing this a tough job of campaigning. Mm -hmm. He really should show the respect to the Jewish community. After a lot of a fair amount of dialogue just to get people to understand. And I think it'd be following if they rather than why they make it In one of my first year there I, when I came here, the, there were four separate planning councils, and we had the responsibility for allocating and campaigning. They didn't have a planning perspective. 
put together a committee to study volunteer involvement. We were basically a campaign run by long executives, not by volunteers. As far as it is, came the additional staff, they are not the people to be the volunteers. They can give you coverage campaigning, but they cannot break down doors. They're not the chief executives of companies and people. So the training, the training should be how to staff volunteers and how to work with them and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's true even today in a lot of communities. And this is some part of a problem in the investigation. Uh, I think it is. A lot of people buy. So what we have to do is find out how to get more volunteer involved. Well, I have Tom McDaniel, the chairman of the committee, and the executive vice president of the Yeah, it's still going. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So, we never contemplated assault being a city of Los Angeles firm because they didn't serve the city of Los Angeles. They got a lot of power. And the power before. Jack Horton was the CEO at this time at Edison. And he had been one of the 25 I interviewed. And he had been the campaign chairman. He had previously been with PG&E from the North. And had been campaign before him. Had always thought very little money to LA because we don't represent LA corporate. Um, but I'm getting into the campaign aspects of it. Uh, and volunteerism, as we call it. The, uh, the corporate board had control of this policy with people from the areas coming in. So from Long Beach, an attorney who actually practiced in Paramount, to the leading person who's fighting downtown all the time, hmm. Jim Kearns, C-A-R-N-E, yes. Give me a letter. Okay. Well, what we really should do is find some way of bring some of the areas together to make regions and do some. I don't know whether you use the word region. I mean, a thing from which, kind of the process of trying to consider a regional plan. At the same time, I had to get some money. We were in the banks borrowing $3 million a year. We had a allocation process, which we did in November. Well, we had a fiscal year of March. It was the most convoluted type of situation. We, we really never knew what we really had as campaign results because aid would never give you a figure that they were going to give you. You just had your monthly checks that came and you hoped. That committee then became the Committee on Regionalization. And we created a structure for things. One on planning. On what we saw initially as potentially five regions. So we had a committee on boundaries. So we, the boundaries committee came to the conclusion not to have a few hearings, but to change the boundaries of the areas. It would be the worst. Some of them would have two, three, or four areas would make up a region. Three committees in each of these regions on each of these substructures. And we would develop papers. And we had around 400 uh, between five and six hundred people involved. We had over four hundred meetings over a period of time from starting in the middle of '68 to the vote in '70 to write the process and to write how we would. Then to get a vote on what the structure would be to 
change. And what we did was, in order to have everybody in the areas, which were not necessarily the level we wanted of leadership, you have a transfer over. What we did was to say there would be a regional committee on, on structure and so forth, but then we would have in the nominating committee and the convening committee for these regions. After all this was developed by the Palmer area people. Whether well, there's two areas and three areas and four areas. We would have three, four, or five people from each of those areas come onto the convening committee and onto the In addition, we would have five members of Lodge and a chairman and vice chairman of Lodge who would be appointed by the board chairman corporately. So we could come in and bring in a new leadership in the community committee and the nominating party. Mm -hmm. And now then came the need for all the leaders in each of these regions. Because nobody visited those regions as such. Because mm -hmm. all the leadership was downtown leadership between New York and the bottom of the mm -hmm. terrace space. And uh, quite some lists. I mean, then had to go out after the thing finally got voted in 1970, it took us to implement people for the nominating committee and seven people for the convening committee. We had to educate those people as to what this was all about because they'd never been involved. Yeah. They had to go and accept the responsibility. Yeah. And then, then determine who it was we were going to ask to be the first board chairman and so forth. And it's always an interesting experience. At the same time as this whole regional study was going on, we had a planning staff for us, but we also had a merger committees with the four planning cuts going on to see if we could get them to merge into the regionalization plan and therefore cover the whole geography rather than just the limited geography. They were going to be bigger and better and so forth. So we brought about the merger within, you know, about three months before we implemented the plan. So all four planning councils merged into our structure mm -hmm. at the same time. So at the start of the study of volunteerism, I used a non sequitur to the committee. I said, I don't have to my staff, we have to cut our costs, we have to get some money. So we cut out enough cost, we cut up down from 218 people to about 160. I had some free money administratively to do something. This came after the the various uh, consolidation of the planning councils and so on, or no? This was before preliminary to the Because I was trying to get there are two or three things I had to try to do. One was one I had to get some money. Two, I had to get some volunteer leadership. So the volunteer committee was the beginning of starting it. And after I had just done this. I was fortunate. Uh, Yordi, the mayor, had created the Urban Coalition. And her and Lily Lundberg were both on the Urban Coalition board, initial group, which had, I believe, initially 48, ultimately 70 people, but 48 top corporate leaders. So the Urban Coalition was thinking of running a campaign, and Louis Lundborg and Victor both recognized that this was going to be in conflict in the United Way getting someplace. So both of them individually came to me and said, you know, what can we do? about this. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Right. But 
first things that I did was to make sure there could be no distinction truly behind between the United Way and Aid. I realized that was right. a mission said that we're, in addition, we were a federation of agencies. And what Aid used to say is they're a federation of donors. <laughs> and so the difference between us was that they represented the donor and we represented the agencies. I changed that statement. We are a federation of citizens to provide a system of services through a partnership with agencies. Every citizen is a potential donor, and every donor is a citizen. So we made a, a, the policy, the mission statement was bigger than that, but that was the important aspect of it. Yeah. And we also had in there that together, a system of services that together with government made up a balanced system of services to make the needs of people. Is in that state. Um, so now the urban coalition is existing. Well, they get it to be to ask for consideration for financing. But by the also had a policy that we did not admit an agency unless it had been in business for over a year and could produce its own. Together a committee chaired by John McCone. John McCone was one of the 25 people I interviewed before. His whole statement was the United Way was no place during the Watts riots and so forth, which he had been the chairman of the McCone Commission and so forth, but often the inner city of health. After the first campaign, which we raised about $2 million more than it had been raised, I got them to set aside $200,000 to start doing some work in the inner city, in the inner city committee working with finance and like Tom McCone, Sigar Oates, who was the head of the Federation of Laborers on the committee, Frank King, who was the head of the Western Bank Corporation, who was another one of the people I, which was the predecessor to First Indian State Bank. Uh, Recall, Frank King asked the question, why don't you cite the statement of mission for each organization? Well, the statement of the Urban Coalition and our statement were almost identical. And uh, these was practically identical. I said, the only problem is we just voted that statement of mission within the last year, and we can't say abracadabra and be it in that community today. So there's a reason for a recognized entity to try to. So then somebody brought up the factor that, well, you had to have one year. And I said, well, we wouldn't take them in as a member agency because they're providing a service to us. They would tell us where we should be funding in the inner city. What we do is contract with them. And so there'd be a contract entity to tell our agency relations people. Well, that's how they came in. The money we had was the money I just saved from staffing. Mm. Yeah, $166,000 was the first, I, I don't remember the figure, of mm. uh, what we gave. So the Urban Coalition ran as a contract entity in the United Way until 1974, 75, mm. And they were having their problems because a black caucus, a brown caucus, was in there and they were having a difficult, difficult time trying to get anything to go in one direction. Therefore, they, were, they needed more funding than what we were able to provide them because there wasn't any success coming out of there, so our board was not willing to give them that full money. And uh, now merge the planning councils. We have a public affairs within the planning area. Uh, so ultimately, the Urban Coalition got merged with us. Merged in, and I can't recall it was 74, 75, that era. And initially, we brought along 
not as caucuses, but units to discuss issues as they related to the black community. And it applies to in various positive ways rather than just having them trying to affect our policies or something. Now a fact people's things in regionalization, which we had going for us, was the fact of that you had industry, big industry in each of the five regions. You had leadership of a common level in each of these geographies. Things you take note of, you know, it's like a organization. For the day that you want to change. We spend all of our time here ourselves. Uh, other things, one of the values we overcame by really getting to the real leadership of this community was that you got above what in all major corporations exist today and existed then. Look at past offices. But these people really were protective of their CEOs. That was their role. And it was the fact that if they control the giving budget, they all had their own agendas. And they didn't go in and ask for a lot more money. They just try to alter the money that they had because they didn't want to keep pushing for more money. And you're not in a position to ask the CEO to give more money. The CEO would only give more money when he felt, he or she felt, there was a great need for it. So when we went and got the level that we got, we were perhaps not loved by a middle management group. Because all of a sudden, the people who were really interested in the token of the CEO had power to say what they wanted done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today is one of the biggest problems in community life is the CEO is so protected. And even so, more so today, as it gets more and more complicated with all the major mergers, the bottom lines, and so forth. You've gone from the era of the entrepreneur up through the era of the professional CEO, but still one who was somewhat interrelated to the community, to now CEOs who are not necessarily interrelated to the communities at all. Well, is, is it, it, uh, currently, hasn't there been a kind of sea change with, with the whole globalization of everything and no. CEOs that aren't any longer even here? No, that's what one, I'm saying. Yeah, that one that's that, at I'm one time were in L.A. now or in some other city or maybe even another country. Yeah. Well, this, is, this has yeah. become, as I say, we've gone through an era which you have bigger companies, bigger companies, yeah. now global yeah. companies. Yeah. And what you've lost, particularly in local communities, are the major banks and the utilities were always the business functions of the community. Mm -hmm. So the community sat on their boards. Those two entities had the most to gain by a healthy, successful community. They saw and felt what the banks and the utilities were doing. And therefore, you'd see the effect when they went back to their own companies and how they thought. And so that's really become a huge problem. And that was the biggest thing against first interstate and security leaving the end. And now Pacific Enterprise is leaving the end. And now deregulation of the electrical, the power industry. You have just changed the whole segment of the yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah. Emerging uh, by funding the Urban Coalition of 68-69, we established a relationship to about 70 business leaders that we were something more than a fundraising entity. Mm -hmm. And it gave us a, an entree. In fact, that was a factor that 
now have the mission statement. We now have the study and volunteer involvement. We now have the urban coalition being funded. We are now funding some inner city programs. We have a philosophy that we're talking about in terms of the allocation process. As most people don't realize that the allocation is this makes available a lot more money available in the budgets of these agencies. At that time, probably five or six times. When I retire about seven times. You could say that your dollar opened up the opportunity for six or seven dollars more program because the total budget of the agencies would increase as you are able to provide the core funding and so forth to establish a program and put a lot of fees and endowment and so forth. Now this was an easy type of sell. But when Dan Houghton became campaign chairman, as I indicated, it was easy to start two funders in ways. Oh, initially it was interesting. In my first meetings in the planning of his campaign, the Red Cross executive had to be a part of all my, our meetings. It's not just me. Good meetings, or? This was just a meeting of planning with Dan Houghton. I see. Paul McCoy, who was the executive of Red Cross. Okay. And he would bring in a fellow by the name of Doug Wood, who was to be his in between for getting things done and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, have, we had a campaign director. Uh, Jack Schenker, and he had a campaign director, Ray Cross had a campaign director, Oz Thorson. So it would really be a meeting of all group. And Dan would always call for early morning meetings, because he usually went to work at about 4 30 in the morning. <laughs> he had a wife who was very, very ill. I mean, he was a very thoughtful guy in terms of always visiting a wife who had. Had uh, pulmonary cirrhosis, developed myasthenia gravis, and a, a great man in terms of his thoughts, his giving capacity. But he was concerned about anything that was going to mesh the power of the right cross versus the remain. He wanted to stay in his powerful position. Interestingly, though. That time, the interesting, strong, but good man. And as we chatted and we got to know one another socially as well, he understood how ridiculous it was to have two people responsible for everything. I said, somebody has to be the administrator, somebody has to be held responsible. And so, Exact. I mean, here's 67. I think it is. Sure. So the 14 areas, 13 were people who were employees of the other way, and one was the Great Crossing. It was very interesting because it was the right person. And that person would be was the Red Cross person. Ultimately, became the executive of the Red Cross Los Angeles chapter. He was by far the best person in their chain of operation. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, one of the things presenting to Dan Houghton was the fact that my belief, as opposed to business, nonprofit organizations should be very broad at the top, or horizontal in terms of organizational structure. Volunteers respond as they feel and know their responsibility is going to be perceived. And they're down the line in terms of their responsibility, and nobody knows but the one guy that recruited them. They don't have any feeling. I've always said every level of voluntary structure then is the structure. Every level of which? Of volunteer structure deadens oh. the organization. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. more, the fewer levels. Yeah. Yeah. So we went to 58 divisions 
in the campaign as opposed to five years ago. Well, how much of this you want of a uh, interesting because can have an ability that people can people in certain positions can recruit this, this industry people to luncheon at Lockheed. And when you invited 14 CEOs, all of the CEOs of the aerospace companies, and this is the banks. That group were probably, I don't know if we had an federation, all were eight out of eight. Well, Dan said, well, we'll help A raise the money. If they're not going to raise it, we'll help them, and we'll get more. I didn't pull well, that was uh, produced from up there, apart from the city. I don't know why with this belief. Well, it was interesting. There were 14 people there. Only, they asked them to each be a division chairman. Only two people put up question marks. Followed by the owner Mackenzie, who ended up Aerojet, who was having problems financially as a company. And so that was understood. The other person was Tom Jones of Northrop. So me, Tom Jones of me. I'm going to tell Frank here. He's got to go out there and convince you. <laughs> so that became my one of my first choice in terms of recruiting leadership. <laughs> I went out, had lunch at Nasser, and the senior VP was there, and told Tom, which I always had a, uh, uh, Dan didn't bring it up in his presentation, the whole question of the dollars that are given and how much they throw off in terms of agency programming, when I told him how much what the total budgets of the agencies were and what they were this. But on to that, and he became the chairman. So I won. <laughs> I always remember what it was that sold them. It was the large amount, the large percentage that went to direct service in it. Wow. Yeah. That, right. that, the fact of that your dollars multiplied when they went into the agency budgets. Uh -huh. yeah. The yeah. fact of the, yeah. the total budget at the time we were allocating maybe $16,000, $16,000,000. Uh -huh. And I was producing programs of perhaps $150,000,000. Uh -huh. yeah. And yeah. so therefore, it was a, yeah. it was, that's a thrust I never thought about. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the value. You've got a system. You don't have just an individually good or bad agency. Mm -hmm. You have a system. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, Every agency comes into being because a group of good people see a need, mm -hmm. band together to meet that need. Sometimes that need changes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes out of existence. Sometimes it expands. Sometimes, but mm -hmm. you have to have some review of how it's operating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but we had 58 division chair people that year, and we ran the effect seminars. At the Biltmore Hotel, but then giving an overall presentation. Mm -hmm. He would never bring in the budgeting story. Mm -hmm. He would talk about the responsibility of the community and his mm -hmm. needs mm -hmm. and so on, but he never did that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as I say, I was relating to the Red Cross mm -hmm. We ultimately when we put that in. Bowen hosted a cocktail party where all the Red Cross chapters, there were 15 Red Cross chapters that were part of us, meeting one of the lives. And who was this person? Bowen, McC Bowen McCoy, who had been mm -hmm. the chief executive of Red Cross and had been the head of Red Cross, I think, for 35 years. And, uh, he was, and his son is now a significant person here. Mm -hmm. Buzz McCoy. Uh, he was very, very successful with 
I guess Morgan Stanley. Um, that's given us very large amounts of Stanford and the Harvard Business School. I mean, we can talk about it one way or another. Oh, no, I just could talk eye to eye. I mean, I fire that campaign director and uh, because he was not able to do the job. Um, all of a sudden, he called me to tell me he wanted to talk to me. He wanted to fire his co-director of the campaign. <laughs> well, and then we went into this question of campaign administrators and the yellow cocktail party, and we read a statement to these area great choice executives and uh, 14 area co-directors as to what was happening, and he was the first assignment. Um, needless to say, the outside chapters thought he had sold them down the river. Because what all of it happened is I, there were 46 positions that were either partially funding and not fund, through our expenses that ultimately came down to 15 people. I don't even know whether they have them today, but I mean, that's... And when we pulled out of... Well, I mean, that function, so I think that's something. So this is all happening in the late 60s. And then the regionalization first came into being was implemented in 71. First campaign was Cy Ramo, was the first campaign chairman of the overall thing. But we had a key leadership in every place we had. Uh, Ray Edwards, who was the head of Glendale Fed, had the next division one. Uh, we had a uh, home of the old down in Monkey, or uh, local membership because Paul was in Pittsburgh as much as he was here. The headquarters were in Pittsburgh. It was probably due to the leadership levels that we had. I mean, we had, you know, I don't know, Bob Fuller. I mean, there was yes. one region to the other, yeah. all yeah. significant yeah. Uh, leadership. Yeah. And so, uh, when I came also in 67, the first, the only gift I truly tried to impact that first year, since I had interviewed. Bowie and I had uh, Lundberg and I had a uh, who was chairman of the committee did this thing. I had interviewed Frank King of uh, Western Bank, Lloyd Austin of uh, Security Pacific, and Staff Brady, which was Western Bank. They gave it through the clearing house, but they gave their corporate gift through aid. Well, I told them what we were doing about putting two hundred thousand into the inner city and so forth. The bank giving at the time was 720000 They didn't have to a million. So in order to force A to become somewhat responsible, as opposed to just sitting over there and giving us what they thought, I created a committee of top-level people to indicate what amount we should put into the campaign that should come from A. If we are helping them, they should be responsible for some of that kind of food. Well, John McCollum had an ethic committee, and they had everything. Well, there's about 15 numbers. So. And yeah. when, what period was this? That this would have been starting in, 60, in the 68 campaign. And I see. Because with Dan taking this position, let's get aid to companies to give more money. Don't try to break it, let's get them to give more money. And of course, we didn't know how much we were going to get from the 67 campaign into July of 68, when the extra 280000 should have been coming through from the banks because it was designated. Now then, when the committee comes together, I had a form that I filled out, which was take the top 10 corporate gifts that I made, find out what they had given. I did some employee campaigns, Donald Douglas, Hank Powell, General Powell, and asked what had been done. I think it would run a year-round campaign, and then ran from that campaign. Some of these figures, the first year they told me to put in 
seven point seven million. One thousand is only for them. Yeah, they told me for eight point three million. Well, I mean, to say this money wasn't coming through to us. Tanks in particular know that their money wasn't coming through because they went from seven twenty to a million, to a million two. But my pushing from outside through Lundborg, Staff Baby, Lloyd Austin, and Frank King, where Frank was a solo writer on it. But. And uh, we, were, we got 7.3, 7.5, 7.6, and we never knew I could keep putting these figures in. I started increasing the shrinkage of putting them, but once I found out. Well, the banks created a study find out why, what should be done. And they funded a study to be done by John McCone. But I had notes that I would send to Louis Lundborg. You know, I couldn't get John as a tough guy to do that. He had his strict on him. And uh, hard participation. Right? Louis, he can do the greatest study in this world. If he has only eight people, only those eight people are going to feel it. <laughs> He's got to have a committee of 20 or a committee of 50 or 60 that he can report to or something. I mean, it's a meaningless. Well, he came out with the fact that the United Way should merge. This was at the time where uh, doing the of the Planning Council and the Urban Coalition and the question of what should happen to them spectrum. So the Planning Council should merge with us, but the Urban Coalition should remain separate. Well, they just turned it down right out of hand. But well, what they did do at that point was, interestingly enough, they decided they had to show that there was another major difference to us. Now, they meaning this committee? A, a, no, A United Giving. Oh, A United Giving. Okay. All right. They went and created a sweetheart deal with the union and became unionized. Professional staff and professional staff. Mm -hmm. uh, the McCrone study, having gone in place, staff ready to get the following year to see if he could do, bring something about the next study of this recommendation. It was the following year. Stan Avery became our board chairman. He said, this is the worst thing there is. So, how much do we still have a late night for dinner? And so the first thing that was to be done was Stan was going to have a bunch of appraisals. He got as many chief executives as he could come. This time, I had a very good relationship with the Eden of the Heart Association. And out of cancer, who was really the spokesperson for all the heart business. And I felt geez, it's very comfortable with it. And I wrote out a suggested program on how to, to get representation and all this. And so I was not met with Stan. The only time my family ever took a three week vacation in my life. <laughs> End up for a trip to England. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And so we, we go, and they had a meeting set up with William Brown and Stan and myself before. And I don't know whether the meeting got sick or Stan got sick, but then they had to get canceled. But I felt comfortable enough. I don't know. I've gone over this thing with Stan. And Stan is the most beautiful man in this world. He's old shoe. He doesn't have a crossbone or a bad bone in his body or in our mind. I was lean, very foolishly, of the papers I had given him and the ideas and thoughts of how ultimately active the such a thing had been so developed. She took a copy of that, came back and held a meeting of the health agencies and blew it out of the water. And I'm back and found that out. And that 
was never heard of that. Oh, another year goes by, and now we get a meeting of Hunter, Ed Cohn, Franklin Murphy, and Cigaros at the Times Market. Steve says, look, it, we can't just have another committee come out of nowhere. What we need to do is, why don't we get Bradley? And Jim Hayes, the chairman of the supervisors. One meeting with the executive committee of the Hayes, the executive committee of the Met Away, and the board chairman of the health agencies for lunch at the music center. Practice of the time tomorrow will pick up the tab. So if the public comes, that there should be a study of all volunteer giving. I mean, it wasn't about murders or but all volunteer giving. And which representation would be had by each of these groups. It also given me a very good thought about a year or two before that to get a person by the name of Nina Beaumont, who was the head of the United Workers, the United, you know, the Communication Workers of America, mm -hmm. uh, to be on the Region 5 board, and which was a central region. So she could find out exactly what the philosophy side of it when she was also on the A board. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll turn this off. Uh, so Dina was uh, on this new committee that was formed as well. And we were doing, we laid out the information sheet we were going to get out of there and so forth. We were going down the line. When all of a sudden, Cigar was out of hiding. Oh, over to see Bill Robinson. Who was, so I knew where Cigar was going. They formally elected. We all of a sudden get a letter from aid cutting our gift by $823,000. Well, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Miller was our board chairman at the time. And he was a very good, strong guy. Very bright. Very, very bright. A tremendous guy. All of them he was homesick, and I called him his son. <laughs> he said, I'm not really sick. <laughs> well, I didn't recall the reaction. <laughs> and so, uh, he says, get down and see Bill and see if he knew anything about it. He told him down and see Bill Robinson. Bill Robinson knew nothing about it. And he was the board chairman of AID at this point. There was a fellow by the name of Ed Shedlock, who was the head of the union for the gas company, which made it interesting that the head of the union, aid was the head of the union for the gas company, and the other way was the head of the company. <laughs> and anyways, Robinson did not anything about it. Now, uh, it was determined what course of action we should take. So we set up two committees. One was a review and action committee, and the other was an audit committee. The audit committee to check over all the years as the progress and what had happened in terms of funding, in terms of uh, results to the United Way. And, and uh, as far as the review and action, we had 39 people. Chaired by Norman Barker, Vice Chairman Thomas Dana. But we had everybody on the way. We had Ed Carter, Franklin Murphy, Bob Bradshaw. One of the things we did is that they kept saying how one third of their board was labor. I went to Bill and said, We want one third of the committee to be, to be, to be labor. Well, I we got three on the audit committee. We got about eight, I think, when we. Review and action committee. 
after reviewing all the facts and so forth, I can already go on with some of these kind of statements. Kevin mm-hmm. Murphy said in the opening remarks of when the committee came together, he said, I'd say these people don't want you. <laughs> well, I'm the branch, I said, I've been in a lot of towns that there's nobody that been two fundraising entities with a similar purpose. Yeah, some of the urgent. Well, we panning back and forth about this pulling out, doing this. And finally, really said, this. Why don't we create a seven man person committee to meet with a seven person committee from A? Bill, be willing to stay with them for another year if they will do the following things. One, to discuss potential mergers. Two, to go back to the level of funding per year. Well, the seven person committee, I don't know that I can name all seven, but I do know that Ray Carl was on it, Franklin Murphy was on it. Uh, Dina Beaumont was on our committee, even though she was on the other one. Bob Fleur, I think it was. That for about three hours. And they get even plus of time. They said we won't do it anymore. Now they're looking right at their biggest supporters. Uh, it's ridiculous. McDaniel's in there. He was the only one, I think, that was not a made account. So when it came out, we had to then take the position. We withdrew from such a good public. And this reminds from this past campaign to come through to us because of the fact that you have used our name. But you cannot use our name. You cannot use our agency's name. But our agency is saying, and only one of the things that they will probably try to do is to try to send you all money's individual. And we were ahead of them. Because that's exactly how the Salvation Army was a key part of that. Mm-hmm. And they would send them a check for $90,000 a month. And I had to meet with them to make sure they sent back that $90,000. Well, after a while, uh, the question was, at least I gave firms to come. It could be those who were, yeah, I don't know whether you know, but it would probably take once, because the people are still alive. Uh, and we, I knew what the basic high values of these companies were, were they. So I'm not pulling it out. I try to stop when I knew I had enough card value to cover the amount of money that I have been responsible for allocating. Mm-hmm. And I left other companies for another day. So the health agency would not get hurt. So when this, at the first year, and they saw how successful it would be, how they just started talking to us, that was our one we could deal with best in terms of interrelationships we had better understanding about the executive and everything. And they're a single about cancers in five different chapters all related to a state cancer society. And so the state was really the viable entity. So we had a bizarre. So having developed a suggested relationship which included allocation processes. So I said to Paul Moore, I said, Paul, you know, we know what we're offering. The community doesn't know what we're offering. They're going to wonder why. I did a hundred and I was about to present what it was we were offering. There's a hot advice that I think we should be doing something. We did eight people showed up. I had stated they were not perfect. Or they say this one? They would not vote for this. Oh, they wouldn't vote for it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Bill Cam, who was the head of Arthur Anderson at the time, and I think I'm sorry, he's a relation. You know, the problem is they're scared of death of you. They think if they come in without any guarantee, 
that you can come back significantly. So that's a problem. Jimson, who is the all in the That's the case. Why don't we say that we will give them twenty-five percent of any increased dollars to take them into the basic figure. And that above twenty-five percent will be allocated on a budgetary basis. Association. Five percent to fifty percent. Who would we figure out to be if we have all the health agencies in? And have this issue there. Well then, price was on a similar, was on a contract of 21.5% of other being raised. We had to get them out of a percentage. Okay, a series of meetings, <laughs> which ultimately put them in a pro greater basis, but would go up or down with that fundraising. And the second 50% would be allocated, same as the health agencies. Uh, I guess, like this Peter meeting that I was trying to set up, you got to do it at the times that people are available. You know, at the time of the year, Paul was just not available. We set it up at 7 o'clock in the morning to do it, security was in the bank. I don't know if Paul hated breakfast meetings with that when he came in. He says, you know, we could have done this at five. I know everybody would have been available at five. <laughs> Just a caustic. Right? But anyway, we got that. Then we got cancer again. Would this have been 50% of their budget? No. Or no. what would the 50% figure? 50% of any increase in the amount of money we raised would go pro rata based upon the amount that they brought in at the time of at them, and it's fifty percent of the their level they brought in at yeah. their yeah. okay. Any increase over that? Okay. And we had as a total corporation, fifty percent of yeah. it would be on a pro rata basis. The other fifty percent. Oh, there was also in there before we figured the fifty percent. Ten percent of the new money would be set to discretionary fund distribution. Which so they. I can't remember whether that was done at the time of the original contract or whether it was done after we all got together. Because it was a, became a very valuable thing to have available because it became like $2 million a year to go into new programs. But, anyways, we then we got sued by A, trying to force us to take a million dollars from the so that we could use MA. Well, they went to court. Now we let all of this leadership be kept sending out memos to people saying what the hell is going on. Then come to us. What happened in that lawsuit was that they thought the court thought it proper for us to take the million dollars, but that they could not use our name, <laughs> nor any of our agency's things. So. They had been cutting back the health agencies that had joined us. Uh, so we took the million dollars. And first we gave back to our agencies that amount of the cut we had, had to take from them. We had the cut of the 800 so on us. <laughs> then we gave that differential because the health agency was not spending it much smaller. But that Different, so we just made everybody whole. Mm -hmm. what we did. Mm -hmm. So as the third year came along, came the question of potential merger. I had a meeting with the executive, and at this time I had brought in under contract also that had done another vehicle in the community called Southern California Building Fund which got started back in the 40s. And there was a way by which a lot of the major corporations and banks and retail stores and all of them made their gifts to all capital campaigns like the building of Hawaii and the okay. <coughs> uh, Having run that lawsuit, I can recall we called a meeting of the first interstate bank 
and it might always lead us back to the end of the line. Mm -hmm. And I remember Jim Montgomery, who was the CEO of Great Western. Hey, geez, that's a pretty good deal. You get the million dollars and you win the case. <laughs> you know, I like those conclusions. <laughs> so, <laughs> in 78, we sat down with two executives. I said, you know, uh, I bring this an easy thing. Black Hill was running the, under the contract of Southern California Building Fund. John Schill. I knew Don because he had been chairman, no, vice chairman of the nominating committee for the high region one, which was the Valley, and Glendale Burbank when we reorganized. Hmm. But he would not serve on the board because he was part of PCC. And basically, he saw fundraising coming at him, and he didn't want that. <laughs> and his statement to Judge was, you know, I, I'm afraid if I come with you all, and I'm going to have to work and give. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, well, how are you doing? You're going to help or something. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting thing. Guy. in addition to getting the money from us. <laughs> Any corporation that, that was on the airport of directors. Mm. Oh my gosh. Uh. <coughs> so the Metro Y never came in. Now, I always felt badly because I had had a great relationship with a fellow named Charlie Jacobson. Who was the executive at the time? Yeah. 
all of a sudden I found them playing some games around me in Chinese, mm -hmm. which dissuaded me a little bit from having as much. I, I just thought I was a good executive and they've done a great job. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they never have come in. Mm -hmm. We gave them the $300,000 for three years and, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so it, the question uh, of following that, in like planning entity becoming bigger and bigger and more uh, responsive. I'm the one of the program, CETA, you know, the, the mm -hmm. government program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that. For all the nonprofit agencies mm -hmm. for the city of Los Angeles. It was an eleven million dollar contract. Mm -hmm. And it was very 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 we had very good results from it. However, I'm thinking about it. During the course of the merger, go to Bill Robinson's office. I know that AIDS organized me and I. I don't think we <laughs> I'll tell you what. If you're able to organize a clerical staff, that's one thing against you on that aspect. I was my professional staff the program they came in for the NLRB to knock the seat apart because you organize both the uh, mm -hmm. uh, UK and somehow. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't say that for sure, but I would say that I, I have a feeling that. Because it was a weekend, mm -hmm. uh, and so I was the office workers. The, uh, that became another part of our United States service. Uh, Silas Discretionary Fund Distribution Committee. And initially that was very difficult because the committee to distribute had to have a percentage of people from Red Cross and from the health agency, so they can feel that they're being left out. And so you see if everybody is getting somewhat of the same percentage mm -hmm. in those fields or into those agencies. And about one or five years really good. We did a lot of things that were good, but it was not necessarily just a free spirit type of looking at total needs. But it all we became that. And that was the key part. And uh, the percentage started changing for United Way because we started putting in for 500000 to go to funding new agencies mm -hmm. out of $100,000 grant, which was in the underserved geographies. Because you had to know that LA as a community, as a county, grew up where the major cities were. The smaller communities never really had any infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were starting to do planning in these areas that were completely isolated. That's very good. Mm -hmm. We created a situation uh, by which daycare became a major issue in our planning vehicle. Now this did not get funded by the discretion fund distribution. But we funded it. We made a loan of five hundred thousand from the United Way to fund a capital for a day nursery on one side. We wanted to develop a daycare center on each of the quadrants of downtown LA so people could hmm. unfortunately I don't know what has happened with that. We funded a study relative to food distribution. Now we developed an agency which later got a Bush, I don't Bush, you know, what do you call it, points of light. Mm -hmm. And all the parties was the got president of this entity by that time. But mm -hmm. The study had a fellow by the name of Malcolm Curry. He was a trustee of SC, you know, and his mm. former head of his aircraft. And mm. We had him involved in the study of the 
and all the supermarkets looking at the food, and how, you know, it was being sent here and there, but it was not in an organized fashion. And we had the trucking association to do some. It was really uh, the studies, the various studies that might be valuable if I could find the paper up there to, which I couldn't find. I've taken one quick look, but I'll keep looking. Yeah. Just talk about. We got the county to look into a program. We found out that the foster children had no health programming from childhood up to, to get a program whereby they got this, this, and this, and that. And that, we got that passed. We had the county health department work with us in deciding what it should be. And then we went before the Board of Supervisors and one of the things that was interesting, like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, I'll just start, but is the county supervisor's vote on transferring the county employees from A to the United Way? Which we ultimately got a final on the vote, but it was a yeah. very, very interesting yeah. thing. I, yeah. I'll come back to that. When do we want to go together again? Yes. All right. Let me. Uh, you let me didn't know you were going to yeah, get into this big <laughs> city as well as the total suburbs of Los Angeles. A committee was created under the chairmanship of Victor Carter who had real acceptance in each of the minority communities for all that he had done with the future. And we had on it Herb Carter who had been a person that had to put the era we were on 1970, 71, who had been one who had come in to confront our lack of doing things at one particular time in our life. A Richard Martinez, who at that time was the vocal, strong activist for the East Side, who was completely against anything to do with the uh, original makeup of our community uh -huh. yeah. and anything that had happened, the traditional aspects. Mm -hmm. And Arthur Take, who I just saw had just died, uh, who was a labor leader, um, Interestingly enough, I can't tell you who the other two members were, but they, I can tell you those three because of what they represented. You know, we tried to come to some conclusions about, one, we had a basic support of a lot of agencies. We had to come to the conclusion that we were not going to do allocations centrally, but all agencies were going to have to go to the various regions for their money. So the local areas would come to know that the major agency headquartered in downtown was serving them out of the community, which they probably didn't know. Uh, and to uh, also make sure we did not impact them in a way that they couldn't keep on functioning. What was determined, and this was before the merger with the planning councils, we asked the planning councils to give us some methodology by which we could come to a breaking up of the money. And they came back with a objective criteria of 16 social objectives or breakdowns that could be utilized in an averaging showing what the impact was 
in each of the regions. Sig Arrowitz, who was not on the committee after seeing it initially, suggested that we then put an application of a weighting of one to five, since there are five regions, according to average uh, salary or average income for each of the five areas, showing the ability to pay for the services. So, in coming to this, 41% of the, as I remember, 41% of the monies came to the central region. Not what we were, we weren't aiming for it, it just happened to be. And as far as the agencies themselves were concerned as to how they would be budgeting, we indicated that every agency, its total service was within the boundaries of a region. That agency would only be budgeted by that region. If an agency services went across two regions, they would have hearings in both regions, and then they would be coming together to make sure the agency didn't get compromised by the actions of one versus the other. And if they're in all five, they went to all five regions. This had come about a little bit due to the fact of, and I think I may have indicated that when I first came, all budgeting was done centrally unless the services are completely within one of the 14 areas. And we took note that in 1968, Catholic Charities was about to close the Long Beach office because of the lack of funds. And we then realized that we didn't have a single person from the Long Beach area on the budget committee downtown analyzing what should be done with Catholic Charities' budget. It gave true indication to us that we had to make sure that the geography had a voice in how the monies were spent. So what we had accomplished by the regionalization was to bring an objective criteria to allocating the monies. We did say in the first year of regionalization, all agencies would be grandfathered at, a look at an allocation level of what they had the prior year. And we would work to make sure that nobody could compromise that first year, and by that time we'd be able to work out the, the problems. Now, following that aspect of uh, allocations comes the question of how does a region allocate its money? Because in each region, we have created a similar type of structure of a budget committee, but we, then we had budget panels for, with divisions for youth services, for family services, for health services, and for general community organization. And the division chair and the panel chairs, because there'd be two, three, or four panels under each of the divisions, would make up their corporate budget, their regional budget committee. And the chairman, vice chairman, or three members of large would come down to be a part of the policy setting of the overall allocation committee of the corporation. And this was similar for agency relations, it was similar for planning, in terms of how do we bring representation to the corporation. This, therefore, made sure that the committees had the voice of the total geography, not just of who you have to put on for downtown. The question of priority setting, after we emerged the planning councils, became a key element. The United Way of America had at that time just spent about five years developing what was known as the United Way of America Service Identification System, EWASIS. And this had definitions of programs within functions. 
go ahead these definitions accepted in each of the geographies and the planning group within each region set priorities of one to five from the enhanced to the ultimate to be phased out at the lowest. That gave priorities to each of the regions. And this was brought into the corporation as a whole, in effect, as our policy and our direction. It became a very important element of setting how to allocate money in the area. And as I have indicated to you, the Discretionary Fund Distribution Committee, the setting aside of free money became an important element mm -hmm. in terms of how to use some of our new money in other directions. And this followed what was coming up as priorities from the regions. Mm -hmm. uh, I had gotten up to the point of the question of the food shelter and the, and the transportation aspects. Before you do that, now the time frame on that earlier period was about when well, would that have been? The question of the setting of the 16 objective criteria weighted would have been done in around 1971. Uh, the question of the priorities and the, or the development of the UASIS and bringing it, it would have been around 1973, 74. Okay. And the implementation of it came in the latter part of the 70s. Okay. Um, which was following actually the merger of AD and all, which took mm -hmm. place. I don't know whether I touched upon the merger of AD or not. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think some, but yeah. 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 And how we brought them in. And, yeah, because I think I got into the question of CETA and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, the personnel aspects of back in 71 of who should be the regional vice president since we had 14 area executives was a very significant thing because now the regions were going to be much bigger, uh, much broader responsibilities. And all in I just came across up there the, the letters from the various area executives had volunteers sent to me trying to say they shouldn't be the regional VP for our uh, at all. And even to the extent that we had a group from one area come in and make a demand to our uh, chairman and vice chairman of the personnel committee, and following which they uh, board chairman of all said, you're going to have to be very big and take him. <laughs> but I said, well, just give me time. <laughs> and we were able to offset that uh, demand. Because what we also had created was major jobs at the corporation. And so with the regional VP job being a big job, and with the central geography being key in terms of the way to find the representation and how to work with the minority. I went to a fellow by the name of Joe Melanato, the head of the, the county poverty program for years here. Yeah, I remember that name. Who had left and gone back to the poverty program in Washington and become the number two person nationally. And he being of Hispanic background. I said to him, if we can get Joe back, he certainly has the reputation in the community and so forth. I don't know whether I could get him to come back. I called him in Washington. He was taking a trip for the poverty program to Denver. I asked him to come on over to visit. And I got him interested at which time the event said he would be willing to be an applicant. Now, I had a 
committee of 18 people for the personnel to pick this. Three people from each of the five regions. But they are selected by the board chairman. And in so doing, certainly the two regions where I had the most push by some of you, we had leaders who were well recognized as leaders in their community, but who had not been involved directly with them. But it was a way by which... With the United Way? Yeah. yeah. But it was a way by which we could get them involved. As I interviewed 25 people, this was a way to get them to feel the responsibility for the level we put in there. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, major entities in that particular community were, they were not really represented in the Jewish community, so I got the volunteer head of the Jewish Federation of that particular community to be one of them. And I got the uh, volunteer head of the Boy Scouts, which is the most powerful agency in that particular region, as well as I picked a key person who had been the home of board chairman of uh, the United Way in that area, but was a head of a retail company, which was picked by the We went through the interviews. There were we had eight people interviewed for the five jobs. And we certainly had the two people who had had a little bit of pressure put on the interview. Now the question is, how do you come to a conclusion amongst 18 people as to who the five should be and where they should be? I have to tell you, George Roberts, who was then the head of Teledown, who was on the committee, came up with a fantastic he said, why don't you prepare a slip paper and we vote one, two, or three whether we think the person would be a very good regional vice president, whether they want to be a moderate, or three, we don't think he should be a regional vice president. Not assign him to a region, but just vote and see how you come out on a balance of giving weight into one, two, and three situation. So that's what we did. And it was amazing. Melvin Addo came out unanimous. And Dave Saunders came out unanimous. And Howard Nolan came out unanimous. So those three were easy. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, the interesting part of the story is that the first board chairman, no, the second board chairman of the United Way itself had been a fellow who was going to publish in the newspaper and he leader in the community where the most pressure was coming up. And I called him and said, look, this fellow didn't rank in the top five. It's been a very objective We'll put a person down there who was unanimous and who relates easily to that particular community makeup. And that was a key thing. Well, then I said, What I will do, however, to make sure if I can work this, I will have that individual become the head of corporate agency relations as a vice president. The feeling down there was that all I was trying to do was bring him into the corporation so that I could fire him. That was so far from the truth. All I wanted to do was he was a person who had been an agency executive himself, <laughs> that he would relate. Yeah. And so and that's what we did in terms of. And I was able to have a significant other staff person because the head of agency relations and an assistant vice president in the central region who was black. So therefore we had the minority aspect. 
completely uh, able to be interfaced with. Um, that was a very key part of the regionalization aspect is getting very right that. And I have to say that I feel very proud of all that we had. When Maldonado left us, he went to become the head of Region 9 AGW. Ed Avila, who you saw in the film, who had been a head of our uh, sort of community relations, what had been the old urban coalition, which we emerged in, mm. went with him to become the associate head of HEW for Region 9. Mm. Uh, mm. Bob Cooper, who was my, actually my number two person, but responsible for the campaign, went on to be the executive of Minneapolis, and then to New York, and then went to Cooper at that time, and then they were trying to take over Baltimore. Baltimore, who is uh, the region of relations at that time, went on to become the head of Miami United Way. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you did some good. They did some good choosing, everybody. Fellow yeah. who, Remarkable. fellow who was my number one region vice president, probably mm -hmm. became the head of the Cleveland United Way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's an interesting uh, staff yeah. aspect. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. the question of following regionalization, change of policy was determined, the voice going to the regions, uh, the conclusion of the health agencies after the merger of aid. Uh, we had a smooth running situation until all of a sudden we had a situation whereby there was interest by the West End of San Bernardino in becoming a part of our United Way. And our region in the San Gabriel Valley really was not a natural insofar as once you go over Kellogg Hill, Pomona did not relate to Pasadena really. Mm How -hmm. Pasadena relates to Pomona. And uh, the West End of Pomona was a natural region because they did it relate to one to one mm -hmm. After a due amount of process, a merger was brought about, and we brought up, we separated the Pomona Valley and put it with the West End of San Bernardino and made it a separate region, not all of them. But is that part of Greater Los Angeles United Way? It was at that time. Was at that time. Oh, we went saying. over the, over the county okay. boundary. And I always felt, personally, uh, what was necessary truth, decentral relation working as it was working, that the natural for this particular area was that Ventura, Los Angeles, the West End of San Bernardino, and Orange County should be one United Way with about nine regions because even in our existence of, with the five and the six regions, certainly the northern part of what was our Long Beach region, Long Beach Palos Verdes, which came up through Whittier, Whittier and Downey more related to Brayer and Placencia than they did to Long Beach. And Long Beach related to Garden Grove more than uh, Fullerton did the Garden Road. Mm. Got Fullerton and that mm. it might have had to create two other types of structures in between, but and certainly if you broke off the west end of San Fernando Valley to go with the east end of Ventura, you would have knocked out all the types of competition. Mm -hmm. That was taking place over counts as to whether there are 
people from the tour or people from L.A. working there. And you would have had a similar set of priorities being able to be established with the social indicators and all. And from a business standpoint, the major accounts were headquartered in downtown. And we were running system-wide campaigns or coordinated campaigns out of L.A. for these communities. And it created a whole lot of who struck John over the production, whether they were getting their fair share or not getting their fair share of these. And you would have gotten all of that written off and able to take place. But it's unfortunate that my successor evidently, I mean, you had an area out there in the West End of San Bernardino, which was the greatest growth area there was in the whole area. But he somehow created ill will. And it had been a new coming together. And by the time the board fired him, there was lack of confidence in that organization. And they were meeting to pull out and take the money value with them. He was in place in the area. Prior to that, uh, I, you know, some part of this might have to be edited out because of this personality. Part of Wald, who was the board chairman at uh, the time, this person that fired, had called me to see if I could keep my ball together. And I had a meeting with a couple of key leaders up there. And it came to the conclusion that it might be able to be done and it was agreed to that by the time they hired a new executive, and they said the one person that it could not be would be Herb Carter. Not that they were against Herb as a person, necessarily, but the letters that had gone up there, which had created the ill will they knew probably were drafted by my successor, but they were signed by her, who had by this time been board chairman. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he was as much as fault as Leo was. But if he was not the executive, it was agreed upon that there would be a meeting at Edison with power structure from downtown LA, meeting with the power of Mount Baldy to say that they wanted it to kept as one. But as soon as Harry Potter was elected the executive, the thing went aboard. And Mari DeWalt had been told that this was this. So therefore, the other thing that they had been bothered by was that one of the reasons and one of the bad things in the concession was that they felt that the board of the United Way was running away from their own financial status prior to his being fired because they were spending monies out of reserves and the cost aspect had gotten too high and they were the only ones raising the issue and nobody else was following up until they were being felt to be people from the other lands that were not respected. And that was the other aspect of it. Um, and this is one reason why I said the person should have been fired at least a year earlier than he was. Um, one of the things he had done was they come in with the idea of we had a long range planning process about this time. He spent untold money in that process. And it was all on diversity, but nothing upon leadership. And by the time he was fired, there wasn't a single chief executive left on the board of directors. And uh, uh, this was a key part of things that happened there
diversity is necessary, and valuable, but they have to be, there has to be the leaders of the groups, there has to be the leaders of the business community to affect. Back at the time of our merger with the planning councils, there was all kinds of debate going on nationally in major cities as to whether the planning council should be a part of United Way or whether it should be a separate entity. And those on the other side said, you compromise their ability to be objective when the planning council is tied into the funding vehicle. The argument, which is my side, <laughs> is planning councils without an ability to implement anything lose leadership and therefore can never implement what they objectively play for. Whereas, if they are part of the funding entity and the leadership sees a need to find an objective study of a particular issue and they delegate it to the planning entity, the planning entity has the ability to bring because they can be nominated by the board chairman, some of the leadership into such a committee to make that objective study, as well as to come back with some recommendations which will therefore be accepted because it has been delegated to them and some of the people have been nominated by them. And then you have the monies to implement what has been studied. And that has always been, but that was a fight that went on ad infinitum across this country as to whether they should or should not be married. Unfortunately, in today's times, there's very little planning taking place, in my estimation. There's always the, the middle-sized community, the, which is somewhat homogeneous, can still do it. But the major big, big cities, with all the mergers of business and the lack of any homegrown leadership and different expectations of chief executives from the Department of Community Relations offices and public affairs offices, there's no buy-in to social needs by the leadership of in major cities. They react, and they don't act. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. And that's what we had going where we were acting, as you'll see in those folders of the ten social problems we were addressing, and we addressed major issues and we had the ability to go before the county. I mean, we went before the county board of supervisors on health services for foster children. And we had the head of the health department coming with us to say this is what is necessary. Mm. And can get a fight another vote to put some money into developing such a system. Mm. Uh, this today does unfortunately take place. The whole development of the info line is a situation which has been existing for years out of the before we took over to the study and then brought in the county welfare department be a partner with us as we went forward. Now, we increased our allocation probably from the info line of about 140,000 to 500 some odd thousand in order to match 1.5 million from the county. We kept it as a separate funding situation. So, this is what could take place when you did your planning with the funding and you had some available dollars. And this is. Yeah. Now, uh, Leadership and structure, right? I've always, I don't know whether I said this earlier or not, I developed two sets of initials, did I to say that before? Structure, leadership, standards? I don't believe so, no. I have stated any organization to be successful can be successful if they address themselves to two sets of initials. SLS. Structure, leadership, standards. 
structure that you can reach the total community of which you're responsible. The program is responsible. In either way, you're talking about the total community. An agency, depending upon the geography, the constituency, whatever it may be, that you're looking for. Leadership, because leaders never recruit upward. So while well, you're talking labor, management. So leadership, because you never recruit upwards, you always recruit at the same level or down. Uh, in order to have uh, a freedom of speech type of situation. Uh, standards, what are you talking about? Standards of programming, or standards of involvement in terms of timing and time given, etc. What? Standards in terms of giving. Because, well, you had a guideline for giving called fair share. That guideline was always an average of your most generous 40%. That meant even as it being an average, someone was above it, somewhere below it. But it was the standard by which the more generous good was gave. And so you need to have that type of giving done by the leaders who are involved. Because as the second set of initials, speak EOS, enroll, or you could say I, involve. You got to enroll those leaders, orient them to the program, to the concepts, to the philosophy, to what standards are, and then you solicit them for their level of giving, because what's going to happen is the most generous givers are going to give at this level, and by the time it reaches the most uninterested person, it's going to bring the average down. So what you're hoping to do is bring about the average of the overall community to a level that brings success. And that's now. In order to bring that, if you are going to solicit the corporations of the banks or the utilities, which are going to set the standards for the community, you had to have some idea of where the most, what the most generous giving was of these groups elsewhere, as well as not just here. So you could challenge the leadership to set the same type of standards for this community. So. The Cleveland executive used to say that Cleveland was the highest per capita giving in the country overall, and all the major in the way. So there are higher gifts per capita in smaller communities, but the major cities. He used to say, Frank, you know the giving levels of the people in Cleveland better than I do. <laughs> uh, always trying to get the information from there. And as Paul Miller said to me, one time, and we came to the Olympic gas company group, which is a very good public group. He said, I think, Frank, that you're, from what I can study, from the gas company perspective, you're asking us to give the Emperor 16th. <laughs> um, it was a, uh, but it was that type of rapport that we could have because we, they knew what we were doing was trying to build success and service to people. And as in the discussions I think I said earlier when Dino Beaumont came out of the meeting with aid, when they turned down our request to go for another year, she just said, Frank, she says I've been a member of labor and aid is known as a labor organization more. They were talking about their institution, the chief executives were talking about human needs. She said I learned a lesson that everything is not stereotyped. So, uh, but that came about because of all this involvement. Um, and uh, the question of success, therefore, comes in role or in solicit. At every level of voluntary structure, that is a structure. A lot of campaigners said, well, geez, we can't staff that many places if you have all these people across the top. I said, what you're admitting to is you're not going to staff them once they're down the bottom. 
They're there. <laughs> it's better to try to get them exposed. And so it's the, the more horizontal your structure is, which forces you, uh, requires you, the blue lump and said you never force a volunteer. You, <laughs> you make it possible, require, to get more volunteer leadership into your act. And that's true if every community organization would think that way. There is no rationale for any of them to be anything but successful. There's so much leadership and so much money in the Los Angeles area. I'm sure that's true. Oh, no. uh, well, that, that is, you know, and it built up. We went from, when I came here, we were raising about 12.6 million as the United Way. And the aid was raising, uh, giving to the United Way about $7 million. So we had about 19 million. Um, the, um, uh, retiring, we're at 85 million. Structure-wise, we had gone from, in the allocation process, from 200 people being involved at the corporation to 1,200 people being involved through the region. We had from five divisional chairmen on the campaign, we went to 210 division chairman in the campaign. And through the ability of soliciting the book, the staff first and the board, because in how to interpret social welfare and social graduate and social work graduate school, if you have the have the book of how to interpret social welfare, it starts with a series of circles and it starts off with staff. And then it says in a board, then it says committees of the board, then it says uh, uh, volunteer involvement, then up to the general public. It just goes up that way. Mm -hmm. well, we had a set of standards inside with 210 people giving properly in the rock camp the campaign. And then with the merger of aid, which brought about the ability to have an ability to speak about our controlling our own destiny. Yeah, we had the major corporations, all the part of one, with the exception of the entertainment industry. Now, the entertainment industry, unfortunately, is a very serious problem to this community. It is still a separate entity. And the arguments they use are the fact that they're not accepted downtown. The reason they're not accepted downtown is they're not a part of the community vehicle. <laughs> if they would get involved and have one entity, You'd all of a sudden see people coming in and being a part of the allocation process, being a part of the planning process, being a part of the campaign process, and they develop a philosophy. And hopefully, the new administration of the United Way can develop the community organization techniques to bring them in because there has now been such a changeover in the entertainment industry. Most of them don't remember why. Permanent Charities Committee of the Entertainment Industry was ever formed. And for the monies that are available in this community, the greatest amount of money potential lies within the entertainment industry, which is headquartered here, and in which their leadership could really be a part of helping to bring this community along. We've got a and there until I see the transcript, except to go back into the national movement, which is going to have some knowledge. 1887 was the first joint appeal in this country, and that was in Denver. Um, and when two ministers, a rabbi and a priest, got together to have a joint appeal. 1913 was the beginning of the community chess movement, and that was done in Cleveland, who really held on to this heritage, to the extent that when I was called back in the Navy in 50 to 52, 
the assistant navigator who was a state was on board ship with me and I was a navigator. Talking one day, knew that the community chest, he had worked at a small machine shop, and he knew the community chest movement had been started in Cleveland. And that just impressed me tremendously. Uh, 19, around the, in the middle 20s, I don't know what you think. It was in Pittsburgh, I believe, the first council of social agencies, uh, council of social planning. Now, uh, you had a program during the Depression to highlight the money's going into national uh, starvation of hunger deals, but they're part of the local chess. Following the war, the, by the way, none of the community just had Red Cross. None of them had health agencies, etc. It was a part of the campaigns. After the war ended, the health agencies became very significant, and mainly led by polio, who the person of Basil O'Connor was the leader with a law partner of FDI, and who utilized the government resources to build the campaign structures in each of the states. Like I know in Massachusetts, it was the lunch program, free lunch program. So they used people affiliated yeah, well, that's how they built with the that program to, to, they, to do well, it. And they built the volunteer structure through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they got other than those people, but that's what the basic, that, yeah. that, that was the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and with the National Health Agency being more prominent, they were the Red Cross. Now having come out of their wartime fundraising, which was really a tremendous job of uh, administration, and I go back and tell that whole story, which is something I think most people can know. Um, came the desire by the three auto manufacturers in Detroit and the UAW to consolidate. And they created, with the staff leadership of the fellow by the Walter Laidlaw, L-A-I-D-L-A-W, who brought about the creation of the United Foundation of Detroit and the United Fund of Detroit. Initially, the Red Cross would not come in because Basil O'Connor was also the president of Red Cross, and he did not believe in the federal campaign. What period are we in there? This is 49, 48, 49. 48, 49. Okay. And Detroit just said, fine, we will create a little Red Cross chapter in Detroit will withdraw from the National Red Cross. And we will fund them. the resulting discussions, viewers, etc. Ultimately, the National Red Cross put a, a policy of local option to the Red Cross chapters with approval to come from national, but the ability to consider it. And therefore, Red Cross went into the United Fund of Detroit. All the major health agencies went in with the exception of polio. And Basil O'Connor resigned as president of the Red Cross over the change of policy. Uh, in about 1953, 54, American Cancer Society decided they were going to test their own way of going independently on polio, polio had. And they knew they had a problem if they stayed in any of funds, so they told Detroit they were getting out. They withdrew, but then Detroit set up a Michigan Cancer Fund, and all the monies were allocated to the Michigan Cancer Fund. And now came 55, and there was really basically 
the Zayas by Community Chest and then United Funds at that time that had organized to try to get the National Health Agency into the Ebola campaign. I recall because in 1955 I went to Luka News and in 57 we tried to, we created the United Fund and we wanted to have mm -hmm. it include the health agencies. And when they would not come, we did a complete study at that time of uh, how their monies were being spent between research, services, education, and we determined if we raised $98,000 from them, we would do 60% more in all areas than the local health agencies were doing. And we created a, a health foundation, which the first health foundation had been created in Durham, North Carolina, when the health agency would be joined, where there are three medical schools. And they were giving the money for research right there to go to North Carolina Medical. We created a research committee, which we had the, the local volunteers, including some doctors, meeting with the deans of the two Carol, uh, Virginia medical schools and the three from North Carolina. And they said the biggest money needed in research was money to get a project off the ground so they could apply to the National Institute uh, to apply to a large foundation grant. And so, and that they each were raising money inside from staff to do that. So this is how we started allocating our money for research for that health foundation. And it became a situation right up through to about 1961 or 62, I guess it was right. I never did put one in the being in, in Rhode Island because we were still trying to overcome the problems that they had in the, in the community of those comments that made. It was a movement that took place for a period of probably 10 years. Pittsburgh created one. Uh, the fellow who ran the Durham one went up and ran the one in Pittsburgh. The fellow named Ed Graef, G-R-A-E-F-F. -E now, uh, in about 1965-66, the national organization decided to have a study done on the South, which is a trade association as I've indicated to you. But, um, how should they be structured? At that, up to this time, they had a mix of volunteers from communities and professional staff. Like five the city's executive sat on the board of what was originally Community Just and Council for Rural America, then became the United Community Funds and Council of America, which later became the United Way of America. Uh, now, this was still the United Community Funds and Council of America at this time in the 60s. And I came here in 67 and became a part of the study, in which was six element we did, which was key to United Way boards, too. All of us voted that there should be no professional staff on the board of the United Community Funds and Council of America. You're talking about national, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because what would happen is we're in that stuff day in and day out. We're talking it day in and day out. We go to a board meeting and we inundate the four volunteers. They're sitting there trying to make a decision on something. And you got the various feelings of each community coming at you. And so therefore we're filling what we needed to have, which was the volunteer leadership. So we, one of the recommendations of the study were that no professional staff should be on the board of the United Community Funds and Council of America. Secondly, that uh, there should be a structure within the organization whereby the professionals met to get input. That later became the National Professional Advisory Committee. Uh, now, there is a, another thing that the, that study probably came with the retirement in 1970 
of the National Executive. And then this man to have the recommendations come in. And now what we did to do is to develop real leaders because there are more national corporations we need to have access to the national corporations for understanding what the social needs were in the various communities they're in. And we needed to have input to the large national media and the leaders would have input. Uh, so there was a personnel committee and uh, all some of us I know I was interviewed and asked to take the job and I had this big for two years so I was about to move and I wasn't interested in it actually. That was a my type of meeting. I met Bill Aramone who had been well recited of late came in as the executive. He had been in various local communities, including in Columbia, South Carolina, South Bend, Indiana, Miami, Florida, and done fantastic jobs. He was bright and energetic. And Bill took over as the national team. And I have to say that he did a fantastic job. He unfortunately ruined my last two or three years of his life. But but he did a job that really helped every community in this country. He built a leadership structure, second to none. He had happened to have two or three key guys in my memory who uh, helped him volunteer for me, helped him with Jim Knight of my great newspapers, called on him Frisco, who was Exxon. Uh, it became ahead of that time. And uh, those people were really key with his public writing style. Pete Malik did the study, nationally. Interestingly enough, the fellow who was watching. He is the, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Pete Malik company was the company that did the study. I see, okay. Oh, what should be the role. I see. And there is, you know, you might want to look for the archives to find the popular stuff you might be interested in trying to copy uh, And uh, the partner in charge was the guy at Washington. That's all I can remember. I think it was Perkins. I, I always remember the interview of firms. Chai Davis and was a Chicago partner came in. It happened to be the Bayer Ewing, who was board chairman of the United Community Funds and Council of America, who you saw in this uh, film, mm -hmm. who had been my board chairman in, in Rhode Island. Ewing. Ewing. Mm -hmm. I was the board chairman at the time this was taking place. Um, and uh, Charlie Davidson was the partner that came in. Well, Charlie Davidson happened to have been the partner in a local accounting firm, Lee Beers Hanover, in Rhode Island, before it merged with Pete Mowick, <laughs> and he then became a partner. And so in came Charlie Davidson, who had been a leading volunteer in Rhode Island. He sits the chairman of the committee, being by a joint, and he sits me as a Los Angeles now executive. But it was uh, uh, interesting. I always remember the question was asked, as Charlie made the presentation, what's the difference between a manager and a partner? Um, because he talked about the manager. That be. Charlie's quick reaction was money. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so, but anyways, that's an aside. Uh, the study did a lot of things in terms of really creating a strong national entity. One of the things that Aaron only did initially was then have a study made of whether the office which had been in New York should stay in New York or should be in Washington near the governmental program because of our tie to so many governmental programs. I was a part of, the, of that study committee and all of you the guy from the head of the piece of the airline and this was what was in general made the recommendation to, to move to Washington. That's how they 
because we had so much relationship with the government. And the name United Way had been created in Los Angeles, just as the name Community Chest had been born in, in Cleveland, and the United Fund had been born in uh, Detroit. The United Way was, which identified the fact that the United Way was not just fundraising, it was planning allocations. It was the United Way of doing things, not just fundraising. I don't want to talk to the name, got a committee to look at the fact we're trying to get everybody in the country to have a similar name so that people can get confused by community chess, United Fund, United Appeal. So we should all at least try, not that he could enforce that, but that he could fully open the idea and the concept mm -hmm. and bring it through the National Professional Advisory Committee in which would get people involved and so forth. So, uh, the name United Way was created. They had to get permission to use it from us. Uh, because it's, uh, uh, the name here is really not United Way Inc. in Los Angeles, it's United Way Inc. period. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody wants to really be technical. Uh, and he's the one who created the Oasis getting some definitions of service. I know. He created a thing called NAV, National Academy of Volunteerism, which was a technical educational program for staff who didn't have the social work background to get technical know-how of how to do the job and write programs and so forth. They fantastically, and then bring in agencies. He would bring in agency executives in there if we taught these technical programs. A fantastic concept. Mm -hmm. uh, the unfortunate part of it is it had to be done because the graduate schools of social work, as I indicated, had dropped the whole private sector back there in the, in the 60s mm -hmm. when poverty money was available and they mm -hmm. could be big time in urban planning and urban. Mm -hmm. Without thinking that everything was traditional, it was in the private sector. You had to have things new. And so that's where the schools of social work are. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and left out the volunteer involvement of people to understand why these programs are necessary. Mm -hmm. you know, this, so there are two wrongs, one professional heads and two volunteer yeah. uh, participation. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had the involvement then of uh, labor in a very big way. Glenn Watt, uh, Joe Byrne at the time of communication work in America was very big. Uh, followed by Glenn Watts, and followed by, uh, by Louis Martin, followed by the uh, head of the CWA in New York. Uh, Mort Barr, who's now the head of the CWA, uh, had the, I mean, but he had relationships with Glenn uh, Berkman. I mean, hmm. He really was a key force in starting uh, an organization called Volunteerism, which is Brian O'Connell's entity at this point, the executive of it, which has all entities in Nashville, separate entity. Uh, he really did fantastic things. He brought about standards of giving because he had the Tom Classen of uh, the V of A and Peter McCullough and Xerox and so forth, they were able to go to IBM and they changed IBM's giving by three times what they're giving up to the community. Uh, went from 1.2 million to 3.6 billion million in terms of what they're giving in other ways. So uh, then it was how they broke it up, not how the you know, United America broke it up, because they could never get into the definition of how you allocate them. They could get them to increase money. But the people that he had, he had Cliff Gavin of Exxon as board chairman, he had Jim uh, Robinson of American Express, Dick Ferris of United Airlines, uh, Mary Gates, the mother of Bill Gates, uh, mm -hmm. as the chairman of the executive committee, mm -hmm. uh, Tommy Frist of uh, Hospital Corp of America. You, you think of a name, they were involved in this process. 
And uh, then he started the United Way International to try to bring volunteerism to internationally. Mm -hmm. And there are 21 community chests in Japan today. There's a community chest in Hong Kong, there's about five in Australia. Uh, I went to New Zealand to consult with uh, Auckland. Uh, Interesting. I mean, it's oh, that's a whole other piece, isn't it? Very it really important. is. Oh, yeah. United Way International is a, oh, gosh, uh, a strong that. piece. Mm -hmm. But this is all a part of the whole movement, which got all set aside completely because it was uh, evidently two or three years too long. He got involved with some women and he divorced his wife, and with that, mm -hmm. he broke apart. Yeah. Not that he probably was a saint before that had happened, I have no idea. But he mm. did do the job, which every community got the benefit of. And it's unfortunate that that gets lost yeah. in a... Because uh, yeah. that's a piece which could mm. be done, and uh, I'll see if I can put some stuff together on it. I mean, but uh, this is a mm. broad history of it. Mm. Uh, I gave you the history of the combined federal campaign back earlier. And uh, let's see what else. Oh, the great research department, both for programs and for uh, research and giving of national corporations. What What is your sense at this time of the status of research in terms of uh, both nationally and locally with the United Way? What because you you in I had the impression earlier from your remarks that that had well, it's definitely declined. declined significantly. And no, perhaps it's not declined. I say my son's in Louisville, so when I was there at Christmas time, I called Rob Reichschneider, who's the executive, who his father had been at one time the head of the Philadelphia United Way, and I knew him very well. And he was a good young executive. And, uh, you know, I talked to him a little bit about the issues of selling donor options, selling this and that, and allocation of the budget. They said, well, we, in this size community, don't get affected by that too much. It's mainly, well, you have the diverse groups who have organized, like the Brotherhood Crusade, which is a, I don't know that I even touched upon that. Community, right? Don't think so, no, no, that's <laughs> true. That's a whole other... <laughs> He's got all these little groups who now come in to try to take that action of dividing versus trying to unite. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Brother of Crusade was the first. There are many that have come along since, not with the same type of power because the black has, or a group has taken the same position of confrontation versus interrelationship uh, all, all the way. And the others try it, but they don't have the leadership. They have some political leadership now, but they don't have the... And uh, I may have touched upon it a little bit, but the Brotherhood Crusade was created in 1968. Going away from the national primitives, coming back both. This is a follow on to the Watts rights. There are groups of leaders who came together, entities representing about 48 different groups. And they finally decided they should have a joint appeal. And they may have touched upon this, but I'm not going to talk about it. And I called by the name of Walter Bramond, who worked for Protestant Community Services at the time, which is now People's Community Services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was not the executive, he was just a staff person. He became a leader. And he put together, with an ad agency, which I can't remember the name of, a program of what he was going to. Had us solicit monies 
throughout all business for these 48 black organizations. And which included us, uh, you know, the movement for power, not social agencies at the time. They were not social agencies. They were, they were, they were, they were, they went to Louis Von Borg, Leonard Firestone, and Chad McClellan to ask them to be chairman of their campaign. Each of whom called me to say, you know, this I was trying to get going with. They said, you won't meet them. I said, I had was the third person I went to. Chad McClellan had been a key figure out of the Watts riots in trying to build jobs for people in the inner cities. And he worked out of the chamber by the time he had had a paint company which had made money, so I mean, he had retired. And he was just doing a very, very good job in trying to get jobs for people. He frankly told me they won't, that you won't meet with him. And so, being new in the community, I took a look at my calendar. I said, I'll meet with them. Uh, I will call you within 10 minutes. And I saw Victor Carter was going to be in the office the next morning at 10 o'clock. Literally, the black community. Because he had been like, oh, uh, the platform. He said, look it. We'll be glad to work with you. We'll work. Uh, planning the segment will work with you to develop what you see as the needs and the priorities. We'll take you in as a special agency to allocate monies to the uh, contract basis. This is funded at that point. That you're well, they didn't come back. So I had Victor write him a letter saying what they are. So we could use it corporations with labor to show what we are. Then it was well, their campaign never got any place. Uh, about a couple of years later, they got some money from aid on a designated basis. Well, when we regionalized, We had a meeting at the L.A. Club, which was on the top of the Union Bank branch in Arnoldshire. We had Tom McDaniel signing uh, as our leaders with two of the people over there. We had Herb Carter there, because he, in, in between, had become president of the Brotherhood Crusade. And we had talked with him as to the things that were needed was to develop the leadership of the black community, to develop the priorities of the black community and all this. And he was sick of this. When they came, it was Braymond and two others. And we made our full presentation of you know, what we would do with them and for them. And they would bring by them onto the board. It was a total package. Uh, once again, we put it right in. Now then, they, Walter Braymond becomes a head of an organization called the National Black United Front. And he gets one started in New York. I think the guy's name was Lord of Paid Staff or, or anyone who got in. Braymond. The question was what to do with them on a national scale since they were going to be showing themselves. So a committee got set up, followed by them a Lyle Carter, who had been the head of the Washington, D.C. University, a lawyer. But it had to be, this is what I had to I guess someplace in Cunningham, who was a councilman at the time, city, uh, mm -hmm. Bakewell. Has now come on to the scene. There's a local president. Uh, there's a local president of the president. If you read the papers much, and you see a lot about Danny Bakewell. 
I remember that name. The guy out in front for another thing. Yeah. It's a tank, a tank, a tank. Yeah. He's also made a fortune on properties and political actions. I mean, he's, he's a big property owner now. And <laughs> he's gone through various ICAP groups for a lot of action in terms of how did he amass the money to get into the but he is. Yeah, was a very big diamond on the mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Danny and I, uh, as I get back there, who's in the who's representing the National Black United Fund? But Dave Cunningham, Danny Bakewell, and all the brave ones, and this one guy from the uh, I said, "How? Why didn't we have a meeting in Los Angeles? We're going to show this And uh, anyways. We made, once again, a discussion relative to what are the things that they wish to have accomplished. Well, they emerged a brother who said wants to be in the city and for the campaign. I said, why don't we have Tom Bradley? set up the meeting. So we have Tom Bradley bring Bakewell, Braymond, and Victor Carter, and Joe Brandon, and Jim Dickinson, and Don Miller. I mean, it was good. We met in the executive dining room with Tom Bradley. Three meetings. Talked about what they wanted. Came back, we even added something here. They added that they said, well, we need to have some funds that we can use that are available on an instant basis. So if we see a need that we want to do, I mean, it isn't allocated. So if I'm agree, we're going to $50,000. I'll let know that. you got to know that all during this whole thing, the discussions, now they don't recognize any of our agencies in serving the black community. Talking about Children's Hospital, Orthopedic Hospital, since it isn't a black board, and it isn't a black staff, it's other than black and tough. Uh, Catholic Charities, visiting nurses, man on a black board, a black staff. The only thing they would recognize is an agency that had a totally black constituency, totally black staff, a totally black board. Mm -hmm. And that was there. We had offered, they wished also to have the United Way Dash Brotherhood Crusade campaign. Well, we had just gotten out of being the United Crusade campaign, which had a Red Cross in effect, having us, we could not then substitute. We said, we're all one community. We're glad to give you a separate type of partnership, like a health agency partnership, which is what we offer this time. Uh, which we will give you the involvement on the board and on the committees of the board. And, and by the way, that's one thing we did with BCC. At one point, we made them an offer, which would bring the total board in as part of our total board. And we'd have a huge board, but they'd have every single board member would be accepted. TCC was? Permit carries the entertainment industry. Oh, entertainment, that's right. Okay. And yeah. that we would place yeah. six people in each of Region 1, 4, and 5, which was San Fernando Valley, Western, and Central. Mm -hmm where the entertainment industry lived and worked mm -hmm. under each of their boards. And we would put three members on each of those allocation committees. And we have an involvement to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we would accept their allocation basis for the first three years. Uh, the professional staff and the old family did not wish to get into 
etc. But, but the Brotherhood of Crusade is still in being, still has Danny Bakewell as his professional head. I don't know what they're raising today. Probably uh, two and a half, three million dollars a year, maybe. mainly out of the county and the city. The, uh, however, when we pulled out of aid, we voted a policy that we would not campaign with any other entity or any other federation. We said we would, we would not want to stop any other entity from having a campaign with any entity. But all that would happen if we took another entity in would be to divide up the money we're raising rather than if they could raise the money and then bring some. Had